This is CS50, and this is week nine, the week where we synthesize the past several weeks in the past several languages, including HTML, CSS, and JavaScript most recently, plus some SQL, plus some Python. Indeed, the goal for this week is to synthesize all of those materials into a topic that's broadly described as web programming. Now, to be fair, last week we did introduce a bit of JavaScript, and via JavaScript can you indeed program, but it was entirely client side as we used JavaScript last week. This week we'll reintroduce a server side component, and indeed, And by tying together the browser, the so called client, and the web server, the back end of any web application. So, to get there, let's consider where we came from. Last week, in order to serve up any of your static web pages, static in the sense that once you write them, they don't change fundamentally, they don't particularly take user input unless you add a little bit of JavaScript, we use just this simple program called HTTP server. Now, there are other equivalents of this command on Macs and、uh, Windows and Linux and other platforms, but for Our purposes, HTTP server, the program, literally just runs a web server. And a web server is just a piece of software that's constantly listening on port 80 or port 443 in terms of TCP recall. And it's just listening for connections. And anytime your browser connects, it looks at the URL that you visited and maybe some parameters that you may have provided via that URL or more generally via a form. And it then serves up a web page, optionally with some kind of output. But of course, every Everything last week really was just static. It was just HTML files, CSS files, and maybe some JavaScript files or JavaScript within. But within the requests that your browsers were sending to that web server, we'll recall HTTP headers like this. And so among the things that program HTTP server was doing, and among the things any web server was doing, was analyzing the contents of that virtual envelope, top to bottom, left to right, trying to understand what is it your browser or your friend or your family member, if you shared your URL with them, was trying to request. And if the first line of those HTTP headers was just get slash, that just means give me the default web page. And by convention recall, that typically means Specifically, give me the file called index.html. That might have been explicit if you literally typed index.html into the browser's URL bar. That would even more explicitly tell the server to give you that file. But recall, we also played with Google. Dot com and specifically its search functionality. And recall that we manually last week constructed a URL that looked like this, and then we replicated it with an actual HTML form. The result of which, when submitting it, brought us to a URL of the form https colon slash slash www.google.com slash search question mark q equals cats. And last week, HTTP server is fairly simplistic. It only serves static content, so it was pretty much ignoring things like these URL parameters. But if you actually want to write a back end web server, a web application like Google.com itself, you need to be able to analyze the contents of this virtual envelope, figure out what path the user wants, or route, so to speak. Slash search would be the route here in, this, in question. And then you have to figure out what the exact HTTP parameters are. Q, in this case, whose value is cat. So someone somewhere has to write code that parses that string, figuring out that you want slash search. And then, OK, let's ignore the question mark. Let's declare a variable called Q and let's give it a value of cat. Like somewhere in the picture, there needs to be code that does that. And today we introduce you to that very code. And we're going to introduce you to a library called Flask. And technically speaking, Flask is also called a framework. A framework is a way of doing things. It's a way of organizing your code. It's a way of writing your code that, more specifically, is just how you should use this library. Now, why does Flask exist? And there are alternatives. Well, Flask exists just to honestly simplify a lot of tasks that, for you and me, would just get pretty boring pretty quickly. Imagine how annoying it would be if you wanted to implement some new website or some new mobile application, for that matter, and you had to write code. That analyzed 
text like this every time just to figure out what the user's input is? Wouldn't it be nice if you can just call a function, the equivalent of get string or get int, and let some other function written by someone else look at that text, figure out what the parameters are and what their values are, and just hand them to you in nice, easy to use variables? So, that is one of the things that Flask does for you. It analyzes the insides of these virtual envelopes, figures out what the user input is, figure out, figures out what the route is. Like slash search or slash index.html that the user wants and makes it more easily available to you, the programmer. And it's a framework now in the sense that typically when you create, as we will today, a Flask based web application, you're going to typically organize your files and folders in this way. And this is what I mean by framework. Frameworks are not just libraries where they have functions that you can call, they typically have a documentation that says to use these functions, you should additionally organize your files and folders in this way. And perhaps the simplest Flask application would have these files application.py, which is where really、uh, all, of our, um, all of our effort is going to go in writing code, in this case, In Python, requirements.txt, which is just a simple text file that enumerates top to bottom, one per line, what are the other libraries that you want to use in your application. Static, which is going to be a folder that literally contains static files like your GIFs, your JPEGs, your PNGs, your CSS files, your JavaScript files, any of the files you wrote this past week. Now they're going to go into this static folder. And lastly, templates. And templates is going to be where more of your HTML goes. And we'll see what the distinction is there versus last week. So, in short, if you want to make a web application, not a website, a web application that takes user input, produces user output, maybe talks to a database, maybe sends emails. Maybe does any number of other things programmatically, you have a web application and we'll use this framework here called Flask. And there are alternatives in the world of Python. There is a framework called Django. In the world of PHP, there are frameworks like Symphony and Laravel and the like. In Java and C Sharp and other languages, there are similar frameworks. So this is just representative of the types of frameworks that are out there. But it's perhaps helpful to know. Before we dive into some actual code, that these frameworks tend to implement certain design patterns. A design pattern is, again, just a fancy way of describing ways that humans write code. Suffice it to say, over the past many decades, a lot of humans working initially independently kept solving the same problems again and again. And they realized, wow, I'm noticing patterns in how I'm solving a problem for this project and for this project and another. And once human programmers notice these patterns, they might formalize them by writing a book, by writing a blog post, or the like, and then give them a name, a design pattern that they recommend that other people adopt. Why? Just because it helps you organize your code. Instead of putting all your code in one massive file, Well, maybe if we put some code here, some code here, we can collaborate more effectively with others and just keep ourselves sane when maintaining bigger and bigger projects. So, Flask implements what's generally known as an MVC design pattern or paradigm. MVC just refers to an acronym representing model, view, and controller. And these are sort of technical terms of art that, at the end of the day, we'll see are relatively simple. Controller. Is going to be where you write most of your Python code. It is the file or files that control your web application. So, in the past, anytime we've written a C program or a Python program, you have, in effect, been writing controller code. We just never slap that label on it. There's also going to be today what we'll call a view. The V in MVC. And view just refers to all of the stuff that a human views the HTML, the CSS, more generally the user interface. Anything involving the user is going to be described as part of your application's view. But again, any of the code that you, the programmer, write, that's part of your controller, so to speak. And then lastly is the so called model, the M in MVC. And this generally refers to what technique, what、uh, service, what software you're using for your data. So maybe that's a SQL database. Maybe that's a CSV file. The model refers to the data that your application is using. So, again, none of these terms are introducing things we couldn't have done last week or in weeks prior. All we're doing by introducing MVC as an acronym or design pattern is just to slap a label on the approach that Flask and, in turn, many programmers, whether using Python or other languages, use. When designing web based applications, there are alternatives, but this is among the most popular and perhaps among the simplest. So, much like we've done with any language, let's take a look at the simplest possible web application you might write using this library or framework called Flask. 
It turns out if you fill a file called application.py with these lines of code, you have just made your very first web application. Now, it's not going to do much of interest, as we'll see, but this is the minimal amount of code pretty much that you need in order to write a web application. That is a program that once you start it, is going to just be constantly listening and listening and listening for TCP requests on port 80 or 443 to come in from people's browsers, your own included. And then now you have the ability to write code that responds to those users. So, what do I mean by this? Well, let's go ahead and see this in action and start writing some of our own very first programs. I'm going to switch over to CS50 IDE, which we'll continue using here. I'm not going to run HTTP server anymore. Instead, we're going to use Flask, which will take the place of that server. And I'm going to go ahead and let's create a very simple file first. I'm going to go ahead and actually, let's do this. I'm going to first create a directory. So, I'm going to create a directory called hello. And I'm going to cd into hello. And as always, if you open your file browser, you'll see the same thing at top left. But in general, I'll focus on the command line. And now that I'm in the hello directory, let me go ahead and create a file. And I'll save this in hello. Whoops, I'll save this in hello. And let me go ahead and call this, let's say, application.py. And again, saving it in the hello directory. All right, if I type ls, I'll see it there, and it's currently empty. So let me go ahead and pretty much copy some of that code from a moment ago. Let me go ahead and from the Flask library, import something called Flask, capital F in this case, which is just their convention. And let me go ahead and、uh, also import something called render. Actually, let's not even do that yet. Let's keep this minimalist at first. In order to turn this file into a full fledged Flask application, that is my own web server, I'm going to go ahead and define a variable called app by convention. I'm going to call this Flask function, and I'm a little weirdly going to pass in underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore. Now, we've only seen that special variable once in the past, and that recall was when I said, well, you should either call main at the bottom of your Python file to call your main function. Or you can do this annoying thing where you say, if name equals equals main, then call main. So, no matter why we used that in the past, this special variable, underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, essentially refers to the name of the current file. So, this is a line of code that says, Flask, turn the current file into an application. That is a web application that will listen for browsers' requests. Now, in my file, I have to tell Flask. What are my routes? A route is simply a URL. So, slash or slash index.html or slash search or any number of other paths that you see in today's、uh, URLs on websites. And to do this in Flask, I say app.route, quote unquote, slash. Now, this is something we've not seen in Python before, but this is actually a Python feature. Anytime you see an at sign at the beginning of a function like this, it's what's called a Python decorator. And for our purposes today, this is just a special way of applying one function to another. But let me leave it at that for now and just say that the convention when using Flask is that at first you define your route. Like your slash default route, then you define a function. And the function can be called whatever you want, but by convention, you should probably call it something appropriate for the actual route in question. And again, humans tend to call the default route your index, so I'm going to go ahead and call this function index. And below that, let me just go ahead and do something silly like hello world, literally returning that string. And let's go ahead and see what exactly happens here after doing that. Let me go ahead now and in my hello directory, if I type ls, notice that again, I only have one file, application.py. In order to start my server today, because it's a Flask application, I do not want to use HTTP server. I instead want to run the command flask run. So, Flask is, yes, a library, but it also comes with a program when you install it on your Mac or PC or the IDE that lets you start a Flask application as well. And you'll see some cryptic output here, but just like HTTP server, you'll see the URL of your currently running application. And if I go ahead and click this URL and open it in another tab, voila, I see my very first. Dynamic web application. It's only printing Hello World. And in fact, if I go to Chrome's view page source feature, notice that it's not even full fledged HTML. It's literally text, but that's because I didn't bother returning any, any actual HTML yet. So let's do that. Let's actually do this more properly and not just return some arbitrary string of text. Let me stop the server and let me focus now on doing this. By default, the route called slash I've claimed. 
means that you should return a file called index.html. Well, let's assume for the moment it exists. How do I go ahead and return it? Technically, I'm going to go ahead and render a template called index.html. And in order to use this function, render template, I need to import it from the Flask library as well. So, Flask again is a library, comes with a lot of functions. The first one of which is called Flask itself. That's what activates this as a web application. Render template is another function whose purpose in life is to go find a file called index.html, grab its contents so that you can then return it. So, it's similar in spirit to using open and read in Python a few weeks ago. But it's going to give us some other fancy features as well. But let me go now into my command line, type ls to remind us that we only have application.py. I don't want to create index.html in the same directory. Flask, recall, has certain organizational recommendations like this here, whereby I should actually put index.html and all of my HTML files today onward in my folder called templates. So let's do that. Let me go ahead and make a directory called templates with make dir, enter. If I type ls now, you'll see that I have a templates directory. Now, let me go ahead and create a new actual file called index.html. Let me store that in my templates directory. And now, let me go ahead and do something pretty familiar. We've done this many times at this point, whereby we just whip up a quick HTML page. I'll give my doc type of HTML up here. Let me have my HTML tag. My language will be. English by default. Down here, I'm going to have the head of my page. Inside the head, I'll have a title. I'm going to call this hello. Down here, I'll have my body. Inside the body, I'm just going to say hello world instead. So, still no, no progress really from last week, but let me now go back to application.py, remind us that we've just now returned the function call. Render template of index.html. And again, this function, render template, is going to go open that file, grab all of the bytes inside of it, and return them ultimately via this line. So now let me go ahead and run Flask run again. Let me go ahead and click on my IDE's URL. Voila, same thing. But now if I open up Chrome's view source feature, Notice now that I've returned a full fledged web page. So, again, not really fundamentally that interesting, but I've taken this baby step now toward generating any HTML that I want. So, let's make this more interesting. I've claimed all along that there is this way, of course, with web programming to、uh, take user input via the URL. So, how can we go about doing that? Well, let me go ahead and propose this. Let me go ahead here and write an additional line of code. That does something like this. Let me declare a variable called, actually, let's do this. After render template, it turns out you can pass in zero or more named arguments. And the names of these arguments are entirely up to you. And we haven't seen that thus far. Thus far in the past, anytime we've used someone else's function, you had to check the documentation or the lecture notes to figure out what were the available arguments you could pass into this function. But that's not true with render template. It's a little more powerful. So if I want to pass a user's name from my application.py file, which recall we're going to start calling my controller, I can say, give me a variable called name. What do I want the value of this person's name to be? Well, really, what I want it to be is the equivalent of whatever is after that question mark, right? The only way fundamentally to get user input from a URL we've seen is whatever is after the question mark. And I don't want Q and I don't want cat. s I want name equals David or name equals Brian. So, how can I do that? Well, let me go ahead and say this name equals request.args.get, quote unquote name. And let me additionally add request to the top of this file. So, what am I doing? When I import this other request variable from the Flask library, this gives me access to the HTTP request and with it any parameters that might have been in the URL. And what Flask does for me is it parses that URL. It figures out what is Q, what is cat, what is name, what is David, whatever is after the question mark, Flask. Parses it for me and hands it back to me as variables. And I can get access to those variables by calling request.args for arguments, dot get, and then the name of the parameter that I want to get from the URL. So now if I save this, let me go back to index.html. And here is why this file today onward is now called a template. A template. Just like in the human world, is kind of a framework into which you can plug other values. It's a template that you can base your own work on. It's like a blueprint that you can base a building on. 
So templates typically have special syntax via which you can plug in some values. And I'm afraid the syntax is slightly new、uh, versus past things we've seen. But if you use two curly braces, as though one weren't bad enough in C and in other contexts, two curly braces left and right, you can tell Flask's render template function to plug in right there the value of any variable that you have passed into render template. As one of these arguments in the function call. So let me go ahead now and run Flask run again to restart my web server. Let me go ahead and open this URL, and it looks pretty stupid right now. Hello, none. But recall that none is a special value in Python, it means something has no value. So you know what I could do? It turns out that, let me go back over here. If I go back to my URL, and let me zoom out so you can see it, let me go ahead and add a slash, question mark, And not q equals cats, because that's irrelevant now. But how about name equals David? And let me zoom in on that. All I've added is the slash question mark name equals David. Let me go ahead and hit enter. And voila, now I have a web page that says hello, David. And indeed, if I view my page source, notice the HTML has been dynamically generated. There is no file on my IDE that says hello, comma, David. Rather, it's been dynamically plugged in. And notice this can change. If I go ahead and change the name to Brian, enter. His page changes. And of course, if I view the page source now, it's as though I had a file called index.html that literally had Brian's name in it. But no, there's just that placeholder within my template instead. And I can clean this up. Notice it looked pretty stupid if there was no value for name. But it turns out the request.args.get、uh, function takes a second optional argument. If I don't know if there's going to be a value and I want to give it a default argument, My second argument to the get function can actually be the default value. So if I go ahead now and let me go ahead and rerun Flask, and let me go ahead now and reload with no name argument, now you see a default value of hello, comma, world. But if I go back up there and put my name back in, now it doesn't need the default. I see what the human actually typed in. So, what's going on here? Well, if you consider what Google.com is doing, when you type in cats and hit enter, that word q equals cats is being passed to Google.com in the URL. Google is running some program, maybe it's Python with Flask, maybe it's some other language that's analyzing the URL, grabbing q equals cats, and then they're searching their database essentially for a keyword of. Cats, and then they're dynamically generating the HTML that shows you all of those pictures and search results of cats. There is no web page, there's no HTML file on Google servers that constantly has a big list of cats. Like, there's certainly no human maintaining a really big HTML file just filled with image tags and cats all day long. It's suffice it to say that's all dynamically generated. And even with this trivial example, we see now perhaps that we're scratching the surface of that very capability. All right, let me pause here. And see if there are any questions or confusion. Because it's a lot all at once, given that with any framework, you typically have to learn the conventions first, and then you can start to be productive. Yeah, so in your, when you called the render template function, someone asked, why don't you need to say it's in templates slash index.html? And why did you just say index.html? Good question. This is one of those just because answers. The render template function has been implemented in such a way that it assumes that your files are in the templates directory. You can technically override that by reconfiguring the application, but the default and indeed the convention is to just put those files in templates. Good question. Santiago? Why, when you declare the add app.route, you have to include the forward slash in, as, as an argument to that? Yeah, so why do you have to include the forward slash? That is the way in Flask of telling Flask, use the following function for this route. And slash is perhaps the simplest, certainly most.、Uh, Basic route that you could define. It's sort of the absence of any other words. So you have to put slash there because otherwise the server won't know what to do if you visit something.com slash. And that's it. We can change this notice. I can change this to anything I want. Let me stop my server and let me change this to slash secret as though I'm creating a secret URL on my website. Let me go ahead and rerun flask run. Let me open up this URL and notice what happens. Nothing happens, not found, 404 when I visit slash. And Chrome is just being annoying. It's hiding the slash just for simplicity these days. But the slash is there, even though you're not seeing it as the human. But if I change this and go to slash secret, then we see that page again. So that app,、uh, at app.route function just lets you define what route should be associated with the following function. 
Other questions? Yeah, over to uh, Sophia. The model, is it a part of the HTML file now? Like the name, I guess, as the data, is it encoded within the HTML file? Uh, yeah, at the moment, I would argue we don't really have a model yet. Like we, there's no database, there's no CSV file. So right now, we're just playing with C, controller, and V, view. And that's totally fine. It's only when we have a full fledged application, like we soon will today, that really the M comes into play. But again, this is sort of reasonable people might disagree. They're just conventions, they're not hard, fast rules. All right, so this is a little、uh, silly that in order to be greeted by my website, you have to sort of have the wherewithal to know that you have to type your own name and,、uh, into the URL bar, right? No one does that. Like, that's just not how the web typically works. We instead find ourselves as humans filling out forms. So let's take this one step further and actually improve things in such a way that we actually have a form instead. So let me go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead and create another file. Uh, let me go ahead and do this. Let me、uh, go into my templates directory where I currently only have index.html. And let me just copy this file, index.html, into another one right now called greet.html. And that is to say, I want my greet file ultimately. Let me go ahead and open this in my editor. Greet ultimately is going to do the job that index was a moment ago. And I'm going to change the behavior of index.html to instead have an actual form. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And I'm going to do a form action equals a route called slash greet, which doesn't exist yet, but I, I wager it soon will. I'll use get initially. And then inside of this form, let me go ahead and give myself an input. Whose name is going to be literally name, because I want the human's name. So the red name is the tag's name. Name in green at the moment is the、um, name of the human in question, although a little confusingly. And then let me go ahead and say the type of this field will be text. And then let me go ahead and give myself an input type equals submit. So I have a submit button, and the value of that will be whatever the default is. So now let me go back to application.py. Let me go back to my hello directory. Make sure you don't run Flask run in your templates directory. Make sure you only ever run it where the application.py file is. Let me run this file. Let me go ahead and open it now. And voila, my slash route, the default route notice. Has changed to be this HTML form. And if I look at the view source of that in Chrome, you'll see exactly what I just typed. So there's nothing dynamic about the form. That is indeed hard coded. There's no placeholders there. But notice that this form has been designed in advance by me to go to the slash greet route using get. Well, how do I implement that? Well, let me actually go into my application now because you'll notice if I type in my name David and click submit, not found because notice. That slash greet does not exist. That is not a defined route in my application. So let me go back to my server and let me go ahead down below and let's just do something similar app.route quote unquote slash greet. So let's give myself a second route. Let me go ahead and define the function that should be called when a user visits slash greet. And again, you can call it anything you want, but let's keep ourselves,、uh, let's keep things simple and just call it the same thing as the route, though again, that's not a requirement. And then in my greet function, well, what do I want to do? Let me go ahead and say return to do. I haven't done it yet, but again, as in C and in Python, take baby steps and just make sure the basics of your code are working so far. Let me rerun flask run. Let me open my URL. And now let me try filling out this same form again. And actually, I'm a little annoyed that the autocomplete is popping up, but we can turn that off later. Let me go ahead and click Submit. And voila, now the greet route does exist. Notice that slash greet is fully functional. It's not a not found anymore, but it's of course not doing anything useful, hence the to do. Well, that's OK. Let me go back here and stop the server. And let me instead have greet render a template called. Greet.html. But recall that greet.html is where I started. It, it is the file now that has this placeholder. So I think what I can do is just move the code that I was using earlier for index, which no longer needs it because index.html has only a hard coded static form. Let me go ahead and just move the name parameter to my greet route instead. Let me go ahead and restart my server. Let me go ahead and open my URL. Let me go ahead and type my name in and sit submit, and voila. So now we have two fully functional routes, slash and slash greet, the first of which just so happens to only display the static form, the second of which actually happens to do something more interesting 
and greet the user. And I mentioned a moment ago, I was kind of annoyed by the user interface here, the fact that it's remembering who typed their name in before. I just rubbing me the wrong way, leaks a little bit of privacy. So let me actually go into my index and recall that there's other attributes in HTML, like autocomplete equals off. I can also do autofocus to give that text field the blinking cursor by default. And now let me go ahead and restart、uh, my server after making this change. Let me go ahead and reload. And you know what? We can do a little better. Let's also add one of those placeholder, quote unquote, name, just so that it's a little more clear to my visitors that, oh, you want me to type my name, David, here. Autocomplete is now off. I click Submit. Voila. We now have a working, if simple, web application. All right. So, what were the additions there? Same exact application as before, but we added a second route and a second template so that one form could submit data. To the other route instead. So let me pause here to see if there's any questions or confusion before we continue to iterate on this. Questions or confusion? I'm wondering how that name equals a double quote name is,、um, is that equivalent to、um, the name that you later specified? It is. And I'll demonstrate this by changing that now. I called it name just because we're indeed talking about humans' names, but I could call this anything I want. So, for instance, in my form, I'm collecting this as the person's name, but I could change it to un-、uh, first underscore name, for instance, if I only care about their first name. Let me change the placeholder to make clear that I only want their first name. Let me now go my, to my application.py. Let me get the first underscore name HTTP parameter. And then in my template, greet.html, let me change this to first underscore name. And actually, I need to make one more change. I need to change this to first underscore name as well. So it's a little annoying that you have to like repeat yourself all over the place, but they mean different things. In the context of application.py, this is a parameter that I'm passing into my template. In the context of this get function, this is the HTTP parameter that I'm grabbing from the URL. And in the context of my Template, this refers to the first of those, which is the argument I'm passing into render templates. And if I reload the server and let me go ahead and reload the form here, let me type in only my first name, click submit, a whole bunch of things change, not in terms of output, but in terms of functionality. And you'll see that now I'm using first underscore name instead of name itself. Other questions or confusion about routes? Or parameters in the URL, templates or otherwise? No? All right, well, let me ask a question then of us. Let me go ahead and scroll this down just a bit to make room. Here again is my index.html file, it contains a form. Here now is my greet.html file, which contains just hello, comma, so and so. What looks poorly designed about this? I'm going to go ahead and revert just to my shorter names, just so a little more fits onto the screen at once. But what looks poorly designed about this? I claim that it's correct. We seem to have a working web application. But what is poorly designed, arguably? Let's hear from Peter. Well,、uh, I guess you're getting it. So the URL is exposing the personal data of the input, whatever they might have put in. The, so, I guess we'd want to use post instead to hide it. Good catch. So, all this time, I have very deliberately, but a little worrisomely, been leaking information in the URL in the sense that now it's probably going to be saved by my browser, right? Often, when you're typing something to your URL bar, you can see what you've searched for before, what websites you've been for, to before. And that's a good user interface feature in that it just helps you type your keystrokes because you can just hit tab and hit enter to finish your thought quickly. But it's a little invasive if you don't want people knowing where you went or what you searched for, or if it's a lab computer or your Your、siblings are using it too. There's a lot of reasons why you don't want your typed input ending up in that URL bar. And I proposed last week that we can avoid this by using、um, what you proposed is post. And indeed, let's do this. Let me go back to my index.html. Let me make a simple change in my HTML file, changing the method to post. Post is going to be almost the same as get, but instead of putting my 
parameters in the URL, like q equals cats or name equals David in the URL, it's going to instead metaphorically put it lower, deeper inside the virtual envelope. So it's still being sent from the browser to server, but it's not going to get remembered by the browser in the URL bar. But if I do this, I need to change my controller. I need my Python code to look in a somewhat different location to get at that. And it's a pretty simple change. Instead, I have to do this I have to tell Flask. That the route slash greet is actually going to support a different set of methods. Rather than supporting get, which is the default, I have to pass in this somewhat cryptic argument called methods. And then I have to pass in literally a Python list of the methods I want this list to support. By default, if you don't use this argument, all of these routes, the first and the second, have essentially this default value methods equals. Quote unquote, get in a list. So a list of size one. It would be a little annoying if you had to type that all over the place. So the default just allows you to just type nothing at all. But if you want to support post, you do have to override this and change the get default to post explicitly. And you have to get the parameters from a different variable. Instead of using request.args, which refers to the arguments in the URL, you have to change it to request.form. These are horribly named. In Flask, these global variables, request.args and request.form, refer to get and post, respectively. Better names might have been request.get and request.post, but this is what we have. So request.args is for get requests in the URL. Request.form is for post requests, where the same info is buried deeper in the virtual envelope. So after those changes, let me go ahead and make,、uh, sorry, not make, wrong language,、uh, Flask run. All right, let me go ahead and open my URL. And voila, I'm going to type in David, click submit, and now notice the magic. Now the route is still slash greet, but no one who uses my laptop later is going to know what my name was, or what my Google search was, or what my credit card number was, or anything else that I might have typed into a form here like my name. But the output is still fully functional. So, this indeed, to be clear, is post is, when you would, is what you would use whenever you're collecting anything remotely personal, like people's email addresses, perhaps, or their credit card, or their password, certainly, and other values.、Um, but、uh, you can otherwise use get, as we've been using thus far. Well, let me ask a follow up question, because I think we can still do better than this. There's something fundamentally about the design of index.html and greet.html that feels a little suboptimal. And I dare say, several of you noticed this same problem in this past week when you were just creating a few HTML files on your own. What was a little tedious or annoying or messy or poorly designed, as best you could tell? From creating these several HTML files for your own personal home page? The chat is suggesting you've repeated some HTML between the two HTML files. Yeah, my God. I mean, honestly, by the second file, third file, fourth file, you're probably just copying and pasting your previous files and then making minor changes. And that's all you could do. With HTML and CSS alone, and even JavaScript, you can't share HTML across multiple pages. Your only option this past week when serving static content was to copy and paste that content redundantly. And look at this. In my index.html file, everything I've just highlighted from line one to seven. Happens to be exactly the same as everything from line one to seven in greet.html. So here's another feature you get with Flask or any web programming framework. These aren't specific to Flask per se. You get the ability to factor out common content. And so, how do we go about doing this? Well, let me go ahead and do this. Let me go ahead and create a third file that, by convention in Flask, is called layout.html. And to be, say, to be sure, I'm going to put this in my templates directory because, again, it's an HTML file. I'm going to go ahead and copy paste all of that same boilerplate, if you will, all of the commonalities, and delete what was specific to greet.html. And I think what we're looking at, lines 1 through 10, is now like a template for, if you will, the layout for my other two web pages. So, you know what? Let me go ahead and do this. Let me use some special syntax and say block body, and then a little weirdly, end、uh, block here. So, this is Flask specific syntax, or technically Jinja specific syntax, which is a language that Flask is using, which someone else wrote. This is special syntax in Flask that essentially says put a placeholder here. Put a placeholder here so I can plug in other HTML in just a bit. So, how do I use this now? Well, let me go to my index.html file and let me get rid of all of the redundancy. 
boiling down index.html really into its essence. The only thing that's special about index.html is that form. So if I want to use the same layout that I just created, let me go ahead and say up here using that special syntax extends layout.html. And then down here, let me say here is my body block, if you will. Let me unindent that a bit. And then let me say down here、uh, end block. So, again, syntax is weird, but the ideas are pretty similar. This is almost similar in spirit to our header files in C, where you could factor out some commonalities and just reuse them in multiple places. Here it's a little fancier because you can kind of have this blueprint, this layout, literally, that you can then plug different content into. So, this first line says, hey, Flask, the following file, index.html, essentially inherits from, it extends my default layout. Well, what's that layout? It's this. Notice that this layout defines this placeholder arbitrarily called body. I could have called it x or y or z, but I'm going to call it body y because really it's like 100% of the contents of my body. So it seems like a good name. And then in index.html, I just now need to tell Flask here comes some code that you should plug into that placeholder. And you can put one or more lines of HTML code in here. So let me go ahead and save this. Let me go ahead now and go to greet. Similarly, delete all that redundancy. And now let me go up here and say again, extends layout.html. And then down here, let me say, here is my body block. Let me just unindent this slightly. And then let me say, end block and save that file. So now these HTML files are quickly looking weird. Like there's barely any HTML in here. It's really just text and weird、uh, Flask syntax. Same thing in index.html. But again, this is one of the values of a web application where you have a programming language like Python. You can factor out those commonalities and really start generating pages dynamically, just like the Googles and Facebooks and others of the world do every day. So let me go ahead now and rerun Flask Run. And cross my fingers as always, because I made a whole bunch of changes here. Let me open my URL. And voila, seems to be working OK so far. Let me go ahead and before I submit this, let me show you the page source. Notice that it's there. It's not quite as pretty printed, like the indentation's a little off, but that's OK. Your templates should be well styled. Everything should be beautifully indented in your templates. But if your templates are then rendered by Flask and the white space isn't quite as pretty, that doesn't matter, because again, the browser doesn't care. But indeed, I have a full fledged, complete web page. Let me submit this form. It seems to still work. That's my slash greet route. I'm seeing hello, David. And if I view page source here, notice an another confirmed form submission. This is actually a safety feature. You don't want websites tricking you into like checking out twice with your credit card via post. So I'm going to go ahead and click reload manually, which confirms that I want to resubmit this form because there's nothing dangerous about it. There is now my greet route. So, this probably would have saved you all a lot of headache or tedium or copy paste. You just didn't have this tool in the toolkit last week. You cannot do it with HTML and CSS or even JavaScript alone in the browser. So, this is where you have templates really shining. Not only can you have templates use two curly braces to plug in values of variables, you can use this curly brace percent sign syntax and plug in actual contents of other files. Questions or confusion?、Uh, there was a clarification question. Could you tell us what is Jinja? Yes, so I skirted over that because I was getting annoyed at just like how many new terms there are today and frankly in the web programming world that we're sort of stuck with. So,、um, This is、uh, a good example of code reuse. There's a lot of smart people out there, a lot of people solving different problems. It would be a little annoying and a little arrogant if all of us tried to solve all of the world's computing problems. And so the authors of Flask decided that for their Template feature, they would not reinvent the wheel and come up with their own syntax. They would use someone else's existing crazy syntax, if you will, that uses the double curly braces and the curly brace and the percent signs so that they're just combining one person's language with another. And this is so common. And this is a good thing because technically you can plug in a different language. If you really are anti Jinja for some reason, you just hate the syntax, you can actually use something else. And so this is actually a demonstration in computing of、um, uh, really a, um, a component. Component based design where you can plug different pieces of software together and have them still interoperate. And we'll add to the course's website links to Jinja's documentation, and we'll see in a little bit what more you can do with Jinja in the template. So, again, Jinja just refers to really the double curly brace syntax and the curly brace percent sign syntax that appears in our templates files.
All right, one last feature、uh, when it comes to saying hello. Thus far in application.py, I've been keeping things a little conceptually simple, if complicated syntactically, by having two separate routes one route slash for my form, and then another route、uh, for my actual、um, greet. Uh, route that actually displays the information. But strictly speaking, I can be a little clever and combine these routes, if only because if you're building a pretty sophisticated website that's got lots of routes, it's kind of annoying if like, every route needs two routes if one form has to submit to another. So let me just propose that we tighten up our implementation and actually reuse our one route. So let me go ahead and delete my greet route just because it's、uh, bothering me that I'm getting a little redundancy there. And let me go ahead and say that my default route, my index, will actually support both methods, get and post. So I'm going to use the same route not only to show the user the form, but also to say hello to the user as well. So I need to be able to support both get and post on the same route. So how am I going to do this? Well, let me go ahead and do this.、Uh, what I can do is if、uh, request.method equals equals get. Then I can actually go ahead and execute this line of code here. Else, if request.method equals equals post, then what I'm going to do is this return render template greet.html, and I'm going to pass in a name of request.form.get name. And then a default value of world. So nothing new. That's just the code that I deleted a moment ago. But notice now I'm reusing the same route. And I'm just checking logically in my controller code, if you will. Well, if the method came in as get, go ahead and just display the form. If the method came in as post, go ahead and greet the user. Now, why is this going to work? Well, it turns out whenever you visit a URL on the internet, like http colon slash slash、uh, www.harvard.edu or yale.edu or google.com, You have always been making get requests. In fact, recall last week when we looked at those sample HTTP requests and the headers, everything we did last week had the keyword get by default in the envelope. So get does not have to, anything fundamentally to do with forms. It's actually the default HTTP verb that's used whenever you just visit any URL. Anytime you visit a URL on the web, you are using get by default. When you submit a form, you are potentially using get, as I did first. Or you are using post as I did second. So, what's the takeaway here? Well, let me go ahead and make one change to my form. I do want to submit via post. I'm going to submit, though, no longer to slash greet, but just to my default route. And if I did everything right here, let me go ahead and run flask run. Let me open up my URL as before. And I'm at my slash route. Notice if I view my page source, the action is going to be slash also. So I'm sort of using the same route for two different pieces of functionality. Let me type in my name, click submit, and voila, amazingly, it worked. Hello, David. But my route has not changed. Now, why is, this why is this useful? It may or may not be. It's just the capability you now have because you, if you can express yourself programmatically in Python, you can distinguish between the two verbs, get and post, that are inside of your incoming HTTP request. And if anything, this just means you don't need twice as many routes just to have one thing pass to another. And it turns out there's also other features that derive from just being able to reuse the same routes. But more on that down the road. Are、right, any questions then on saying hello, Flask, or these routes? No? All right. Well, just as a teaser here, here is a screenshot of pretty much the very first web application I made back in the day. When I was an undergraduate, I got involved in intramural sports, not in an athletic sense, but in a computer science sense.、Um, I volunteered to actually build the very first website for Harvard's freshman intramural sports program, otherwise known as Frosh IMs. At the time, we were using paper、uh, to write your names down on and email addresses down on, your ch- choices of sports. We would walk across Harvard Yard, the grassy area in the middle of Harvard. Slide it under the door of one of the proctors or resident advisors, and voila, we were registered for sports. But there was no website.、Uh, there was an internet, but there was no website yet. So this was late 90s. So I thought it would be fun to implement that same idea of a piece of paper for registering for sports in a web browser. And now, unfortunately, I only knew C and maybe some C at the time, and a couple of other languages from other CS courses. I knew nothing about web programming. So I taught myself how to web program with、uh, the help of lots of questions and answers from friends. I happened to use 
use a language called Perl. And the result at the end was this frightening design here、uh, with lots of menu options up top that use JavaScript and some images here and some、uh, CSV files essentially on the back end that stored all of the registration data. I knew nothing about databases at the time, but it was my first foray into web programming. And what we thought we'd do after our first break here is re implement the idea of a registration system using HTML, CSS, and Python, and ultimately SQL to re implement the same idea, worrying even less today about the aesthetics. But let's go ahead and take our first five minute break here. And when we come back, frosh IMs. All right, we are back. So, the goal at hand is to implement the most primitive of features that I first implemented via this Frosh IMs website years ago that of allowing students to register for sports. And to register for a sport, let's collect everyone's name and maybe the sport for which they want to register. So, how are we going to do this? Well, let me go ahead and copy just the layout. From our previous hello examples, just because it's pretty good boilerplate. And I'm actually going to make one change. It turns out that it's very easy to make your websites pretty mobile friendly just by adding a couple of lines of code. In particular, in my head here, I'm going to go ahead and add a tag called meta. It's going to have a name of viewport. Viewport refers to the rectangular region that defines most of your web browser's user interface. The content of this meta tag is going to be initial scale equals one and width equals device. A width. And this last keyword is kind of the magic. This incantation here essentially tells the browser whatever the, user's de-、uh, whatever the width of the user's device is, assume that that's the maximum width for my web page. And it's going to scale my font sizes automatically up or down based on whether you're using a laptop or desktop or iPhone or Android phone. Or something else altogether. There's other things you need to do to make your websites responsive, so to speak. And it's helpful to use libraries like Bootstrap for that. But this minimally helps at least address issues of font size. So I'll start including that here as well. Now, let me go into my application.py, which unfortunately for Frosh IMs is empty. And indeed, to be clear, Over the break, I created application.py as empty, a templates directory, and inside my templates directory is just that layout.html. So we've got a little bit of work to do here together. So let's go ahead and start building out this application. Let me go ahead and import from Flask、uh, the Flask function itself, plus render template, which I bet we're going to need, and then also request, which we're probably going to need as well. Let me initialize the application with this Flask、uh, function. Using underscore underscore name. So again, that's literally how we began earlier. And let's just go ahead and start defining our first route app.route, quote unquote, slash. Let me define a function called index, but again, I could call it anything, but that's good convention. And just to get me started, I could be really uh, take, uh, do this quickly and say return to do, but I'm kind of confident now in my ability to at least use render. Template. So let's at least render a template called index.html that admittedly does not yet exist. So let's make it exist. Let me go ahead and create a new file called index.html. And again, I could call this whatever I want, but if this is going to be my default route, I might as well call my default page the most common default name, which is index.html. Let me store it in my Frosh IMs folder, in my templates folder. So that it's in the proper place. In here, let me go ahead and say that this extends、uh, my layout.html. And then down here, let me say my body block will be whatever's in here. And then my end block will close that. And here, now I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with how much code I've written. So let's just put a to do there and let's make sure this whole thing works. So let me go back into my directory, do flask run, enter. All right, go ahead and open up this browser tab. And it just says to do. So I think I'm in a good place. Indeed, if I view page source, I see a full fledged web page, including that meta tag we just added, but with just a big to do here. Now, what I want to do, the biggest thing I want to do is actually have students be able to register for a sport. So let's go ahead and define ourselves an HTML form via which to do this. So inside of my body block, In my index.html template, let's go ahead and first just call this like the registration page with an h1 tag. And then let me go ahead and give myself a form. The action will be, I mean, we, the sky's the limit. Let's keep it simple and just do slash register rather than make, complicate things by using the same route again.、Uh, let's keep things a little private. So let's do a method of post. So, that my roommates don't know what sports I'm registering for or not registering for. And then in here, let's go ahead and ask the user for their name. So, let's go ahead and do an input、uh, name equals name, where the name of this、uh, input is going to be name in the human sense.、Uh, the type of that box will be、uh, text. And let's add some of the fanciness as before auto complete equals off or oof,、uh, auto focus, whoops, 
autofocus. And then over here, a placeholder so that it's self describing of name. All right, and then let me go ahead and give myself a submit button. Input type equals submit. And let's add a value of register just to make the website a little more user friendly. Let me go ahead and stop my server and restart it so I can reload all of these changes. And let me go over to this URL again. And voila, we have the beginnings of a form. It's only asking for names, so it's not quite there. So I need to ask for some sports as well. Now, there's a bunch of ways we can do this. And even though you might not have seen them all yet in CS50, you've certainly used them on the actual internet when you're visiting websites. So let's do a drop down menu initially. Let me do what's called the select menu, because you select an option, the name of which is going to be sport. Select menus, if you read the documentation or follow an online tutorial, you'll see that they must have children called options. And children must have、uh, values. So, for instance, let's use a value of how about dodgeball, which is a common intramural sport. And then inside of the option tag, you actually have to say, much like a link, what the human should see. So, I'm just going to redundantly say dodgeball here, too. And let me go ahead and make my life a little easier here. Let me、uh, to do, to do. Just to speed things up, let me do a little bit of copy paste here. And how about we change this one to、uh, flag football? Flag football. Over here, let's do,、uh, say, soccer and soccer. And again, just like links, there might be this duality, the same values, but they don't have to be the same. But for now, we'll keep it simple. This is what the computer will see, this is what the human will see. And then down here, we'll call this ultimate frisbee. And here, the same thing ultimate. Frisbee. OK, a y so now I have a working drop down menu. So let me go ahead and prove as much by restarting my server, visiting my same URL, and voila, the user interface is kind of ugly, definitely very minimalist.、Uh, but if I now type in my name David, notice that by default, dodgeball selected because one of those options should be. But I can actually fix that. Let me, I don't like how I'm forcing everyone to think they have to do dodgeball. Let me do an option here with an empty value, for instance. And I can even say something up here, for instance, like、uh, let's just say what it is sports. So with no value. So it's not an actual valid option. Let me go ahead and open my URL now. OK, a y so now I see sport in the drop down too. So David, sports. OK, a y it's a little weird that you can register for sports.、Um, that's not really a thing. So let me fix that. In, it turns out if you read the documentation for a select menu, you can actually disable、uh, the option and also,、um, let's say, select it by default. So these are just additional attributes that you would discover in the documentation for the option tag that now let me make the user interface a little more robust just so that users aren't registering for sport. Let me go ahead and do David. And now notice sport is selected by default, but it's grayed out. It's not a valid value anymore. So, minor user interface improvement. Dodgeball sounds amazing. That was not an intramural sport in my day, but it apparently is these days. So, let me go ahead and register for this. OK, a y but of course, not found. Well, why is that? Well, if we look at the URL I just ended up at, I've not implemented my slash register route yet. All right, so let's do that. To do that, I need to go back into application.py and let's go ahead and do some registration trickery. App.routes slash register. I'm going to define a function that I might as well call register, but I could again call it anything I want. And in this function, let's keep it simple initially. Let's just go ahead and return a template called success and just presume that the registration was successful. And in fact, let me go ahead and create a new file called success.html in the frosh.ims templates directory. And let me make sure that also extends layout.html and that it has a block body and, for good measure, and block. And then down here, I'm going to keep this so simple for now. You are registered! Exclamation point. Not really registering anyone for anything, but I'm going to claim that they were. So now, if I rerun my application and I go back to my form here and I now re register David for Dodgeball and click register. Huh. Now it's a bug. And let me pause here just to see if the pieces are fitting together. Method not allowed, even though I'm at slash register. Any thoughts on how to fix this? Method not allowed. And notice you can even see in my terminal window in red an error message status code 405, which means method not allowed, which is a rare one, but I indeed screwed up. Yeah, over to、uh, Santiago. 
Um, yeah, I think that when you define the app that route for read or register, sorry, you didn't specify methods is post. Yeah, so by default, my methods are all get. But if I want to use post for privacy's sake, recall that I just have to tell Flask that the methods I want you to support for this route are this list of verbs or methods. And that list is going to be of size one with just the keyword post in it. So, again, when you encounter these issues, which you absolutely will when doing all of this for the first time, don't worry so much about the specifics of the error message, but the ideas. Like, what's gone wrong? Method, method not allowed. What could that mean? The only methods we've talked about are get and post. So, maybe it's something related there. Well, the route in question was slash register. So, maybe it's something related to my register route. And see if those kinds of clues can lead you to a solution like. Santiago just proposed. Let me go ahead and restart my server. Let me go ahead and reload my form. Type in David again. I'm going to select dodgeball, register. Voila, you are registered. All right, I'm not actually registered for anything, but I feel like there's still a missed opportunity for error checking now. In fact, let me go back to my form, not type David and not select dodgeball and click register. Well, this is kind of stupid. Like it's, claim, it's saying I'm registered. Even if I only type my name, no sport. You are registered. So there's a missed opportunity here for some error checking. So let's at least go in and add this. Let's go ahead and do something like this. How about if not, request.form.getName or request.form.getSport or not that? Then let me go ahead and return render template、uh, failure.html. Otherwise, I'll return success.html. So let me try this now. Let me rerun the server, flask run. Let me go ahead and reload my form. No changes to the form. But now, if I don't cooperate and I click register, OK, a y now really bad things are happening. This is one of those 500 errors. Let's see where I screwed up. Internal server error and the subsequent paragraph are not very descriptive. But if I go to my、uh, terminal window, here's my exception, a Jinja2 exception. That's the templating language. Failure.html、uh, is not found. All right, well, that's just because I made a stupid mistake. So let me stop the server. Let me go ahead and copy success.html for now. Let me go ahead and paste it in here. And I could probably factor this out, but we're going to keep it simple for now and call this failure.html. Put it in Frosh IM's templates. Save it. Now let me rerun my server. Now let me go back. Let me try not typing in anything and just registering. OK, voila. Now it's actually checking. And if I go back here, name, OK, I'll not type in a sport. It's still not checking. But there's still this kind of hack here. You know, you recall from last week that if you right click or control click on anything in any web page, you can inspect it in Chrome or your preferred browser. And that lets you start poking around the HTML. And watch this. Maybe I'm a little bit upset that、uh, there's no, let's say, tennis. Tennis is not offered by the intramural sports program, but darn it, I want to register for such. Well, again, using a browser, there's nothing stopping me from, for instance, ah, I don't know how to do this. Let's change Ultimate Frisbee to tennis. And literally change the HTML on the page. Zoom back out, close the inspector. Ha ha! Now tennis is a sport at Harvard. So now watch what I can do register for tennis, type in my name, David, voila, registered for tennis. Right? I've hacked the website. All right, so in some sense, I kind of sort of have hacked the website this time. Now, obviously, I'm not doing anything with this information on the server at the moment. I'm just blindly saying registered or not registered. But notice what I've just done. In fact, let's really notice what I've done. Let me go ahead and inspect the page again. Let me go to my network tab and let me resubmit this form and watch what happens here. Let me go back here. Let me type in David. Let me、um, do this quick hack again. Let me go ahead and right click on sport, inspect. Let me get rid of ultimate frisbee and change this to tennis again. And let me change this to tennis again. Enter. Now let me go to my network tab. Select tennis from the drop down. And then down here, let me go ahead here and、um, click register. Notice what's going on down here. Just like last week, you can see a list of all of the HTTP requests. So let's look at slash register. Let me now zoom in on all of this and scroll down to the Form data, which we didn't see last week, but is there for post requests. I have legitimately sent from my browser David and tennis to the server. The onus is now on you, the programmer, to make sure that you're not actually going to let me register for tennis if it is not a supported sport. So now there's more error checking necessary. It's not sufficient to just trust that the user typed in a name and a sport. 
you can't just check for the absence of either of those. Now we should really be smarter and make sure that whatever sport the human's browser sent. Actually exists at Harvard. And you could imagine this going very wrong very quickly if it's a bank account. Like, how much money do you want to deposit? Well, I'll just hack the HTML and change the amount of money I'm depositing or withdrawing, right? You should not be able to change a server's data or database by just changing some HTML. You should never, ever trust. Your users, or myself in this case. So, how do we defend against this? Well, there's a solution to this problem that actually gives us some other features as well. Let me go ahead and get rid of this、uh, silliness where I've literally hard coded all of these sports in the HTML, which literally I resorted to copying and pasting. That should have been the first clue that、uh-uh, we can probably do better. Let me instead go into application.py. And let me go up here and let me just define a global variable called sports. I'll capitalize it as is the convention when、uh, defining constants. And let me go ahead and say the sports are going to be this Python list. So I'm going to keep it pretty and put it on multiple lines using square brackets because it's a list. Here's where I'm going to say dodgeball as one sport,、uh, flag football was our next, comma, soccer is our third,、uh, volleyball fourth, and then lastly, we'll leave in ultimate. Frisbee as legitimate. So those are my sports. How do I now use that list of sports? Well, I can just pass them into my template. I can say something like this sports or anything, x or y or z, but sports is more descriptive, equals sports. So this is to say, I'm going to create in my template a variable called sports, the value of which is going to be that same. Global variable. And to be clear, Flask requires that you choose a name. You can't just pass in sports because Flask just won't know what to do with a single argument like that. You have to give these things names. And again, it tends to lead to this redundancy where you're reusing the same words, but one is your variable on the right, the other is the name you're using in your template on the left. So now let's do this in index.html. Here's where templating gets more powerful. In templates like Jinja, you don't just have curly braces left and right, and you don't just have the blocks with the curly braces and percent signs. You even have some simple programming constructs. I can actually do something like this, it turns out. I can actually do something like this for sports in sports. End for, so it's a little stupid the syntax that you literally say end and then the name of whatever the, the preposition was a moment ago. But now let me go ahead and generate an option whose value is quote unquote the current sport. Close that, and then in here, let me say sport again. Done. Now I have used a for loop in my template, the syntax for which looks almost identical to Python. That's deliberate. The authors of Jinja essentially borrowed Python's own syntax, so it's not too much. Uh, new information、uh, overload. And notice what I'm doing. I'm using this Jinja syntax to iterate over that sports variable. It's a for loop, so I'm saying iteratively set sport equal to the first sport, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, then the fifth. And then inside of this block here, this for loop, I'm using the double curly braces to just plug in the sport there, plug in the sport there. And what's amazing about this feature. Of Flask and in turn web frameworks in general is that now when I run Flask run and I open up my URL and go to this form, voila, it's there. It's dynamically generated for me. And if I look at my page's source in my browser, notice that all of those options are indeed there, but I didn't have to type them out manually. I now have it in an array and I'm dynamically generating even more HTML. And what's more powerful about that savings is that now I can go into my application.py and let's not just check for this value. So if not request.form.getName, that was saying if there is no name. And then this part here was saying if there is no sport. Why don't I more specifically say, or the sport that the user input into the form is not in sports? So here's where Python gets pretty elegant. Now I'm checking two Boolean expressions. Is it the case that there is not a request.form.getName? Or is it the case that there, the sport that was in the user's form is not in the global variable sports? Then it should be failure. So you can send me tennis, you can send me water polo, you can send me any sport you want. I am now going to reject it because I am validating your submission against server side data. And again, this is thematic. Unfortunately, you can never. 
ever trust user input. You should always assume that some annoying、uh, hacker out there, or friend, or sibling is going to be trying to hack into or crash your programs. But you can defend against that by programming defensively in this way. So, case in point now, if I go ahead and David、uh, dodgeball register, that works. But if I do this little hack again, where I go into my HTML, I go down here, I change ultimate frisbee, for instance, to tennis, and also change it here to tennis,、uh, zoom out, close that, choose tennis, type in my name, David, voila. Wait a minute, <laughs> damn it. Why did that work? Oh, wait. OK, I didn't restart the server. It was still running the old code. Now I open it up. Oh, now we have to do this again. OK, now I'm going to go ahead and hack the site. Let me go ahead and inspect this, expand the sports. Let's go ahead and change Ultimate Frisbee to tennis. Let's go ahead and change that to tennis. Close the window, change the drop down to tennis. And now, there we go. OK, all right. Was confused for a moment, but again, just restart the server and it will reload the changes we actually made. And thank you so much, Brian, for diving in there to save me. But <laughs> figure it out. All right, any questions or confusion beyond my own now on what it is we've just done by one, dynamically generating a list of user、uh, select menu options and also validating on the server against that same list of data? Any questions or anything on your end, Brian? Nothing here. All right, so let me just demonstrate real quickly these just different user interface mechanisms. And suffice it to say, we're not too focused for our purpose on user interface design. Using a library like Bootstrap, can you make these forms look much prettier just by adding a few more HTML tags and a few more uh, CSS uh, classes? But let me go ahead and make a one tweak here. Whereby we can change the UI from being the select menu to a bunch of different things. In index.html, I can go ahead and define inside of my for loop, instead of using the select menu, an input、uh, name equals sport, type equals radio for radio button, which are the mutually exclusive circles that you might tick on a box、uh, on a website. And then the value of this will be this particular sport. And then over here, let me go ahead outside of the radio button and actually display to the human. That sport name. Let me restart the server. Let me reload my page. And voila, we no longer have a select menu, but we have radio buttons, which achieve the same result, but they're just laid out in a slightly different way. And they're indeed mutually exclusive, like an old school radio in a car where you can only select one of them at a time, but otherwise the site works completely the same. So, which to use? It depends. If you've got 100 different sports, you probably don't want 100 different radio buttons, if only because they take up so much space. But if instead、uh, you might want to use a drop down menu instead. All right, so what's the key thing we're still not doing? We've got a pretty dynamic user interface, but I'm just throwing away the information once the user clicks register. So let's actually start remembering, just as I did back in the day, who has actually registered so that we actually have a proper working registration system. So, how can we go about doing this? Well, we've seen in our look at Python in the past that we can store data inside of a Python program using a list. Using a dictionary, using a set. There's a lot of data structures that Python gives us. So let's start simple and let's actually do that. Let's go ahead and store our registrants maybe in a dictionary. So in application.py, which is thus far now unchanged, let me give myself one other global variable, registrants, and let me initialize it to an empty dictionary. And recall that we did this to implement a phone book where I added my name and phone number and Brian's name and phone number a couple of weeks ago. We used a Python dictionary to store those key value pairs, name and phone number. Here, let's do something similar. Let's store the user's name and the sport for which they're registered so that we then have in the computer's memory a list of all of the Valid registrations. So, how are we going to do this and what needs to change? Well, let me go ahead and change this back to the select menu just because it fits on the screen a little better instead of the radio buttons. And from here, we will have again the user interface that we saw earlier. So, let me go ahead and do flask run. Let me go ahead and open this up. And voila, we have that same interface as before. The goal of which now is when I click register, I don't want to just naively see you are registered or you are not registered. I want to actually register the user. So I think we're going to need to do a bit of work in application.py, the file that's actually processing 
the user's registration. So instead of just validating the form by checking if they had a name or a sport that was in sports, let's do something a little different. So let me go ahead and sort of start anew here. And let me do something like this name equals request.form.getName, just so I have it in a variable. It'll be a little easier to use. And then let's just say, if not name, then let's go ahead and return render template、uh, failure.html. All right, let's then check sport. Sport equals request.form.getSport, storing it in a variable just so I can do this、uh, a little more cleanly. And then if not sport, go ahead and return render template,、uh, template failure.html. And then let's do one more check, but I'm just being a little more pedantic this time. If sport、uh, not in sports, then let's go ahead and return render template. Failure.html. But you know what? This seems a little silly. If all I'm doing, if I know as the programmer what the error is, but I'm just telling the user, you are not registered, that's not particularly good design. I'm not telling the user any、uh, information about what they did wrong. So let's do this instead. Instead of failure.html, let me go ahead and create a different file called error.html. Uh, and this will be called error.html in my froshims directory, in my templates directory. And in here, let's go ahead and actually put an error message, for instance, something like this message. So there's nothing really there other than a placeholder for message, but let's see what this will do for us. Let's now go back to application.py, and instead of error.html, let's be a little more specific and pass in an error message like missing name. And down here, let's change this to error.html and say a message of missing sports. And down here, let's change this to error.html, whoops, error, error in the error,、uh, message of invalid sports. So there's a sport there, but it's just not in the list of valid sports, so we should tell the user accordingly. So now let's just try this real quick.、Uh, let's try this real quick and input、uh, this data incorrectly so we can see these. Let me rerun the server. Reload the form. Let's type in nothing and just try to register. OK, a y missing name. It's more useful than just you are not registered. All right, fine. Let me give you my name, David. Register, missing sport. OK, a y now let me go ahead and give you a sport. And now if I registered, I'd probably get some other error because I haven't handled the successful outcome yet. So let's finish this up. Let's go back to my、uh, application.py and my register route. And then ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to register the user? I want to remember that the user is registered for a given sport in the computer's memory. And the computer's memory, recall, I'm using by way of this global variable called registrants. And it's all caps just to make clear that it's a global variable, but that's not required. And then down here, why don't I do this? Registrants name equals sport. So this is very similar to what we did with names and phone numbers, keys and values. Where I'm using name to index into the Python dictionary and I'm setting the value equal to the sport. And then let's go ahead for now and say return render template, whoops, render template success.html. So let's test this out. Let's go over to froshim. So, whoops, let's learn from my mistakes. Stop the server and reload. Let me go back to the browser. Let me go ahead and type in David, who will register for dodgeball, register. Claims it's registered. Let me do Brian will register for flag football. Registered. He is registered. But I don't know who's registered or not. I don't know. But you know what? Let's do a little sanity check here. Let me just print out registrants, right? When in doubt, print or printf as your friend. So let's just do a little poking around here and run flask run again. This time, let's go back to the form and register David, sport, dodgeball, register. Same behavior, but down here, notice. We have this. Oh, and I see a couple of you are registering as well.、Uh, so <laughs> I see Lucas has registered for dodgeball as well.、Uh, Brian Y has registered for volleyball. So, there, OK, a y now、Set、Harsh has registered for volleyball. So, this is the problem with having an internet when we do these live demos. But apparently, it does in fact work. So, let's go ahead and make this a little cleaner here. And instead of just printing registrants, let's go ahead and do something like this. Why don't I go ahead? And you know what? Let's do this. Let's go ahead and render a template called、um, registrants.html. And I think to make this happen, I'm going to need another route, but this one will be kind of interesting in that we've never dynamically generated quite this kind of success message. So let me go ahead and whip something up real quick here. Let me go to a new file, registrants. 
index.html, frosh IMs, templates, and then、uh, in that folder, templates. And in here, we're going to do extends layout.html. Down here, block body,、uh, end block. And then down here, in here, I'm going to do this is going to take me a moment here h1 registrants. Then below that, I'm going to give myself an HTML table. Inside of the table, I'm going to define what's called a table head, which is not strictly required, but it helps distinguish the head from the body from the optional footer. Inside of here, I'm going to create a table row. Inside of here, I'm going to create three columns using th, table heading, which you might not have seen before. Typically makes things bold by default to make clear it's the heading. And I'm going to put the person's name and then another heading of their sport down here. And then below the table head, I'm going to do t body. Which is the table body, another tag you might not have seen before, but just represents indeed the body. And I'm going to generate dynamically a whole bunch of TRs. So for name in registrants, let's go ahead in this Jinja for loop in my template and output dynamically a table row. Inside of that table row, some table data, specifically the person's name, and then specifically in the other column, the person's、uh, sport. Which I can access, as we'll see, by way of a variable called registrants by indexing into it via the name. So, registrants in a moment is going to be a dictionary that I pass into my template. I think that's it. It's a little tedious to type it out, but notice there's no data. It's only HTML and templating. If I go back here now and pass in registrants equals registrants, just like with the sports variable, I'm providing my registrants template. With a variable called registrants, but again, I could call it x or y or z, but registrants feels a little more appropriate, setting it equal to the value of that global variable, thereby giving my template access to that dictionary. If I now save the file, rerun Flask, go ahead back here. Oops, let me go ahead and do this once more. Let me go ahead and rerun Flask. Let me go ahead and select my URL. Let me go ahead and register David for Dodgeball and click register. Voila, Harsh, you beat me to it. So, Harsh is registered for flag football. David has registered for dodgeball. It's not the prettiest user interface, but if I view the page source, you'll see that we indeed have the table head, followed by the table body, followed by Harsh for flag football, followed by David for dodgeball, and then after that, any subsequent registrants who are registering at the same time. So, this is pretty cool, I dare say, in that now we have the ability to save. All of these registrants to a global variable. But what's a downside here? We've made progress. I'm now showing you users who have registered. So that means the RA or proctor who's running the sport knows who's registered. But there's a catch. What could go wrong here? What's bad about using a dictionary? Sophia? I was thinking that every time you reload the server, you're just going to reset and you're not going to save the data. Exactly. If I'm just using a global variable, it'll work forever so long as the server runs forever and the IDE stays online and we don't lose power or any other number of reasons. But as soon as the web server excuse me, stops or is turned off or something goes wrong, we're going to lose all of that data. So, this is why a couple of weeks ago with Python, we actually used CSV files or ultimately a SQLite database. But let me make one change too, because what I don't like right now is that at the moment, the only way to view my registrants is to actually register yourself. And maybe that's a feature if you want to require people register before they see who else is registered. But it feels nice to have a different route, maybe slash registrants, that anyone can visit to see the actual. List of registrants. So let me go ahead and make one tweak here. Let me go ahead down here and define another route, app.route slash regist whoops, registrants. And then define registrants as my function, but I could call it anything I want. And let me actually move this rendering of template here. And you know what? Let me be a little clever. Let me actually redirect the user to slash registrants. So let me go ahead and import one more function up here. Redirect from the Flask library. And this is a function that will literally do one of those HTTP 301s or some other status code that will send a location to the browser that says, uh uh, go here instead. And the reason for this is that it's just nice now that inside of my register route, Once you're registered, I don't need to like literally copy and paste this line in two different places and actually have redundant code. I can just say redirect the user to slash registrants, which already exists now, so that they can see themselves and who else has registered. So if I do this again, let me restart the server. Let me go back to the form, type in David for dodgeball, register. 
OK, so Harsh, you didn't make the cut this year,、uh, this time, but we see、uh, Break and Moash and David now registered in that split second, amazingly, for these sports. But notice the URL, which is the key point. Now we're at slash registrants. And if I keep reloading, I'll keep seeing all of the changes since then. All right, but Sophia makes a really good point in that the data is all going to be lost. So I think we should clean this up and maybe do one final version here where we actually save the data in, for instance, a、uh, SQLite database or maybe even email it out so that we have a backup copy as well. So let me go ahead and propose this. Let me go ahead and propose that we make a few changes here. A few changes,、um, borrowing some inspiration from our look at both SQL and Python. So I'm going to leave most of this alone for now. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this variable. We'll have to store the data elsewhere. And instead, let's go ahead and use a database, a SQLite database. So let me go ahead and declare a database、uh, as SQL. SQLite colon slash 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 froshims.db. Let me go ahead and import this. This recalls from CS50's library, the SQL library. And let me go ahead in my window for just a moment here and copy the database from a, an example I brought with me just so that we don't have to create the database as well and sort of rehash things from、uh, our week on SQL. Let me go ahead and grab the database here. And indeed, voila. Database is out of the oven, and we now have a local file in my directory called froshims.db. So let's go ahead and first look at this database SQLite of froshims.db. Schema, enter. Here's the database table that I created in advance, just so we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm creating a table called registrants with an ID column, with a name column, and a sport column. The primary key is going to be that ID. Uh, the text field should not be null and the sport should not be null. But we've seen all of this syntax actually in past weeks. So it's just a simple table to give me an ID for every registrant, a name, and a sport. But I'm going to do this in Python now. So let me go ahead and go back into my,、uh, let me go back into my application.py. And let's go ahead and do this. When I want to actually register the user, let's validate them as before. Making sure that they've given us their name and their sport. And now let's just use a little SQL. Instead of saving it into what was a global variable, let's do db.execute,、uh, insert into registrants a name and a sport. I don't need the ID, it will auto increment for me as the primary key, and two values, question mark and question mark. Again, beware SQL injection attacks. And let me pass in name and sport. And I think that's all I need. I'm now going to use a little bit of SQL in my Python in order to insert that name and sport into the database. And after that, I think I'm fine. But I do need to change registrants because this variable down here no longer exists. But that's OK because recall from our look at SQL and Python, I can do something like this registrants equals db.execute select、uh, star from registrants. Indeed, that simple query would seem to give me access to all of the registrants thus far. And now I can just pass that in like that. Again, it looks a little weird that the name of your variable in your template is the same as the name of this variable. But again, that's because on the right is the variable, on the left is the name you want to use in your template. But you could call it anything you want. All right, here as always, let me cross my fingers. Flask run. All right, let me go ahead and open up my URL. Let me go ahead and type in David Dodgeball register. OK,、uh, interesting. So Harsh and Naveen got in there real fast. Again, you're just kind of waiting with the submit button. But this is a mess. Something is clearly wrong now. I'm seeing like weird dictionary syntax. But that's because I haven't adjusted my template. So let me go into registrants.html and recall that when I select. With select star from registrants, this is like getting back rows. I just renamed it to registrants, but I'm really getting back rows. And rows are just、um, dictionary. Each row is a dictionary of columns and the values therein. So I think my syntax just needs to change a little bit. In my registrants.html, I should really think of this as for registrant in registrants. And let me go ahead and output the registrants name. And down here, let me output the registrants sport. So again, this is more similar to the time we spent on SQL and Python than it is to HTML and CSS right now. Now I'm iterating over all of the rows. And if you prefer, let's change even the semantics. Let's go back over here. Let's do it just like we did a couple of weeks ago. Let's just get back a bunch of rows. 
pass in those rows to my template, and now iterate over those rows. And each row has a name field, and each row has a sport field. So that too would be equivalent. But once you understand the difference, let's call it what they really are instead of this more generic row. So let me revert that. Now let me go ahead and rerun the code. Let me try to beat everyone else to the punch. Type in David for dodgeball, and oh my God. OK, a lot of people. OK, new and better, harsh. All right, so you're working really quickly, it should seem. So now we see all of the same results. The database is really hopping now. I'm a little nervous about scrolling any further, so I'm going to leave it there. But we now have a full fledged web application, honestly, that is now much more representative of real world websites. We have our own database using SQL. We have our own templates dynamically generating this table, even though it's ugly at the moment, but I could certainly beautify it with some CSS or some Bootstrap in particular. But we now have a full functioning website. What would be the icing on the cake? You know what? It's pretty cool, even though we take it for granted, when a website emails you a confirmation. What if we add one final feature, just like I actually did years ago, whereby you email the registrant or yourself to、uh, report that someone has actually registered? So, how can we go about doing this? Well, let me go back into my code here and let me add one final flourish. I'm going to scroll up to the top here and I'm going to import another library. From Flask Mail, import mail and message. And again, you would only know to do these things from a class, from the documentation, from a tutorial, or the like. I looked it up in advance to see how to do this. And then I have to, according to the documentation, there's a bunch of initialization steps required when you want to write Python code to generate emails programmatically. You've got to know your username, your password, and a bunch of other settings. So let me go ahead and configure those now. App.config,、um, quote unquote, mail default sender. Is one, and I'm going to go ahead and set that equal to os.getEnv of mail default sender. So default sender refers to a default email address. So for instance, if I wanted all these emails to come from me, I could do something like that. But instead, I'm going to store them in variables elsewhere because I pre configured my ID in advance so that no one could see my username and password. So I'm just going to grab some of those values. From the so called environment. You won't use this feature too often, but we'll show it to you in the next problem set. It's a way of getting access to a variable that's been defined elsewhere in your IDE or in your Linux system or Mac or PC more generally. All right, I need to define a few more of these. Let me go ahead and just do some boilerplate, even though this looks like、uh, a little copy paste, which it is. It is, in fact, necessary because there's a lot of settings for a mail server. So let me do them one at a time mail password. I don't want you to see that either. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that from my environment mail pa password.、Uh, let's see, I need a mail port. Mail port. So that's going to be 587. It turns out I'm going to use Gmail, and Gmail lets you send email on TCP port 587. So I look that in, up in the documentation too. Mail server, in fact, will be smtp.gmail.com. I found that on Google's documentation. Uh, mail use TLS, which is a type of encryption.、Uh, let me go ahead and enable that as true. And then lastly, mail username. I don't want you to know what username I'm using, but I'm going to go ahead and grab this from my environment. Username. And this is actually deliberate, though I'm sort of saying it tongue in cheek. It is bad, bad practice to type in usernames, passwords, or anything remotely private or secure into your code. Because imagine if you did type your own Gmail username or password into this program just to try it out, literally right now at home, and then you ran submit 50 or check 50, guess what? You're sending your username and password to us, the staff, not to mention GitHub and the whole internet by including it in your source code. So while I'm sort of、uh, making fun, At what I'm doing here, this storing of private information in these environment variables is actually best practice because it means it's not in my code. I'm not going to accidentally copy and paste it elsewhere. All right, I need to import one other thing, which will explain all of these red X's. I need to also import OS. So it's kind of a bold claim to import a whole operating system, but there's indeed a library that comes with Python called OS, which gives you access to things like these environment variables and others. Whew. OK, that was a lot. And I need one last line of code a mail variable equal to passing my Flask application to a function called mail. All right, I think all of those errors will soon go away. I think it's just being a little slow on me. Let's go ahead now and actually send mail. Indeed, the red errors are gone. Let me scroll down. And before I redirect the user, 
to slash registrants. But after registering them, let me go ahead and do this. Let me define a message variable equal to capital message, which is the feature I imported from that library. And let me create a subject line of you are registered. And let me go ahead and, huh? Oh, I don't actually know who to send this to. So that's OK. Let's go ahead and change something here. Let's go ahead and have the user ask not for their name. Let's ask the user for their email now. So I'm going to change my actual form、uh, to ask for their email instead. And now let me go back over here and let me go back in here and set a second argument of re、uh, recipients equals email. And let me change this here. Let me go ahead and get the user's email from the form. If there is no email, let's le- yell at them and say missing email. Sport is unchanged. Let's go ahead and insert into registrants. You know what? Let's not bother inserting into the database, actually. Let's keep this super simple. Let's get rid of the SQL stuff. Let's just have it send a confirmation email. So it's even simpler. We'll keep the focus entirely on email here. So I've created the message with a subject line and the two lines, so to speak. By the recipients. Now I'm going to go ahead and send mail.send message. Save. Here's where I'm going to cross my fingers as always. I'm going to go ahead now and run this program. I'm going to restart,、uh, reload my form here. It's indeed asking me for email. Let me go ahead and type in,、uh, let's say, John Harvard's address here. John Harvard, like me, will register for Dodgeball. And let me go and click register. Now the website is about to say <laughs> internal server error. Which comes as a surprise to me, but let me see why. Oh, I accidentally am still using the database. So let me fix this. Let me go ahead and, since we're not using the database anymore, let me go ahead and revert to our simpler return render template success.html. All right, user error. Let me go ahead and restart the server. OK, bad gateway, whole other problem. Here we go. J Harvard at CS50. Let me go ahead now and register for Dodgeball. Register, crossing my fingers. I am registered. And indeed, let's go over to my other browser here where I have Gmail open. I am currently masquerading as John Harvard in Gmail here. Let me go ahead and refresh my inbox. And oh my God, a message from the CS50 bot that I am indeed. Registered. So now we have a programmatic way of sending emails. I hit it twice, so I got two emails this time.、Um, but indeed, I've now dynamically generated emails as well. Whew, a lot. But the ideas really are just based on templates and the idea of sort of putting our controller logic in application.py and all of the user aesthetics in our so called views. And now that we've had a database, or in some sense, an email backend. Now we also have the notion of a model where the data is actually being stored, or in this case, sent. Any questions or confusion or clarifications here on the use of SQLite or email or any of these Frosh IMs features? All right, so why is there a shopping cart with cookies on the stage? Well, for that, let's take our final five minute break. We'll come back, talk about something called sessions, and build even more sophisticated web apps. Back in five. All right, we're back. And there's one feature that we haven't really fundamentally touched on at all when it comes to web programming. And it's one that you and I take for granted every day, anytime we log into some website, buy something online, or generally interact with dynamic websites. And that's a feature that's generally known as sessions. There is a mechanism. Uh, built into web applications, whether they're implemented in Flask or in other frameworks or languages, that allow the web servers to remember a little something about you. And this is super important to how the web today works, because without it, you wouldn't be able to log into Gmail or to any other site and have the website remember that you are logged in. Consider, after all, when you log into Gmail, you type your username, your password, maybe your two factor authentication code, and then you see your inbox. And from there, you're not prompted to log in again the next time you open an email. And then the next time you open an email, you stay logged in for some number of minutes or hours or even days on your computer. Even if you close the browser tab, even if you shut down your computer, when you come back to Gmail, quite often, you're still logged in. And it remembers, in some sense, that you have been logged in. Well, how does this actually work? Well, underneath the hood, anytime you visit gmail.com, your browser is sending a request like this for slash, the default route of gmail.com. 
And hopefully, you're going to either see your inbox, or if you're not yet logged in, you're going to see that login screen. Indeed, the response is probably going to come back along the lines of 200 OK, content type of text HTML. And that's when you see the login form. Or your inbox. But recall from last week, there's other HTTP headers that can be tucked inside of that virtual envelope that provide hints to the browser and server as to how they should interoperate. That's indeed what HTTP is all about. It's a protocol set of conventions that govern how browsers and servers should interoperate. And it turns out that sometimes this server, Returns what are called cookies. And odds are you've heard of cookies. Odds are you have some sense that cookies are bad or dangerous, but also necessary. And indeed, all of that is true. Cookies are essentially、uh, pieces of data or even files that are planted on your computer or your phone by a server that help them remember. That you've been there before. In some sense, they help remember who you are, but even websites that you're not logging into very often put cookies onto your phone or your laptop or desktop, which essentially might be a big random number that only you are given, so that even if they don't know that it's Maggie who's visited the site, or Ryan, or Nicole, or someone else, they know that that unique identifier. Has been seen before, and they can therefore track your behavior. So, if you've heard the term tracking cookies, that's all it is. It's some、uh, piece of data, a big random number that's been installed on your browser that your browser then remembers. And the mechanism is as simple as this one of the HTTP headers that comes from server to browser literally is set dash cookie colon, then the name of a cookie, for instance, session, and then value. And the value might be that big random number. And because of HTTP, Again, it's a protocol that browsers and servers speak together. The browsers are designed to send that cookie back to every subsequent page you visit on gmail.com or whatever server you're on. In other words, when you visit gmail.com, then an hour from now, even after closing your tabs, or even tomorrow after going to sleep, your browser is not only sending these headers. If you have been given a cookie from gmail.com before, your browser sends a similar header, but without the word set, it says cookie colon session equals value. So, unbeknownst to you, your browser is constantly reminding the server that you've been there before. And this is similar to the real world when you're perhaps in.、Um, When you go into a, a club or a bar or an amusement park and you go through the gates, you typically are allowed back in、uh, by having your hand stamped. And this way, they don't have to check your tickets again or your ID or the like. They just stamp your hand, which is a little reminder that you have been there before. And so, in fact, here, I've got a little stamp here. If I visit a website, it's like my hand is being stamped here. And my browser, by design of HTTP, is supposed to, every time I visit another page, click another link, represent my hand just like you're going back into the bar or the club or the amusement park to remind the person at the door, the bouncer, that you've been there before and to let you through rather than prompting you to log in. Again. So that's what a cookie is. It is like this virtual hand stamp that's put on your computer, but your computer is designed to present it again and again. So if you've ever wondered how sometimes you go shopping on one website and then all of a sudden, creepily, you're on Facebook or something else and you're seeing ads for the very thing you didn't buy on this other website, that all derives from cookies. Long story short, there's advertising companies that Facebook and Google and others partner with that put little Uh, images on the website or JavaScript files or other such files. And because those ads are on different websites, the cookies are shared across multiple websites in some sense. So it's like you are constantly presenting your hand stamp to all these different third party companies. And this is how they're advertising、uh, to you or even tracking you at worst. As an aside, when you use incognito mode or private mode on your browser, all of your cookies are temporarily thrown away. You get an empty cookie jar, so to speak, so that you do appear to be logged. Out. And in fact, even in class, I've used incognito mode a few times because I want to start fresh and not have any of my prior clicks or our prior demos messing up future demos. But the reason I was doing that was just to get rid of all cookies and therefore all state. So, on the one hand, cookies are an incredibly important and powerful mechanism, but suffice it to say, and more on this down the road,、um, they can be misused,、um, certainly when it comes to one's privacy. 
、uh, or security. So, with that said, let's focus on the good part of cookies and consider how a typical website remembers that you're logged in. Let's take that very simple idea and make it clear that it's all within your power now with code to do this. So, let's start as follows I've created a new directory called login, just to demonstrate a program that logs people in. I've got my same layout as before, and I've added one more tag. It tends to be best practice to tell the browser、uh, that you're using essentially Unicode. This way, I can have emojis and other characters in my HTML. So, I've added this line five,、uh, which you'll see on Bootstrap's documentation and other sites. So, now I have sort of a good starting point for this page. But there's really no content, there's just a block being defined here block body. So, that's just my same layout as before. And indeed, if I type ls, you'll see an application.py and a templates folder in that templates folder for now. Is just layout.html. So let's go ahead and start writing a quick application whose purpose in life is just to present the user with a form via which they can log in and then remember that they are logged in. So from Flask, let me import Flask.、Uh, let me also import the redirect function, the render template function, the request variable, and now a session variable. This is something new. And then from Flask session, let me go ahead and import session. And then down here, let me do app gets flask underscore underscore name. And now I need a few more lines of code from documentation app,、uh, app.config open bracket session permanent equals false. And again, this is specific only to the library called Flask Session that I'm using. And that library is going to enable hand stamps essentially for my application. And I'm going to configure it to use literally the file system. So, session type equals file system. And file system is just fancy speak for the hard drive or my own IDE account. And this is an alternative to using a database or, or something else like that. And then session app. So, this is just boilerplate. I literally copied these three lines from the documentation for this library. But to use this library, and this was also true of the mail library a moment ago, there's another file I should、uh, point out. So, when I am here, I should create one other file that I mentioned earlier, but we haven't created ourselves, this time called requirements.txt. And I'm going to put this into my login directory. And I'm going to require Flask for this application. And I'm also going to require a library called Flask Session. So again, I claimed before on the slide that requirements.txt is just a simple list of the requirements, the libraries you want to use. And there are commands you will use at the command line. To install those requirements, you won't typically need to do this for the problem set, but just so you've seen it, if you want to install the requirements for a Python application, you typically do a command like this pip、uh, install r requirements.txt. And I'm not going to do it because I did it in advance, but just know that in order to install libraries, it's much easier in Python than it was, for instance, in C. They tend to be more easily packageable、uh, via this technology called pip and things like it. All right, let's go ahead and create a couple of routes. App route slash、uh, def index. So just boilerplate as before. And let's just go ahead and simply return render template of index.html by default. And then、um, let's go ahead and create one other route app.route slash login. And in my login route, which will be governed by a login function, let me go ahead and return render template. Login. So let's keep it simple for the moment. And now let me go ahead and implement this form. So let me go ahead and create a file called login.html, whose purpose in life is just going to have my login form. And what I want in that login form is just a space for the user's name. In the real world, I would most certainly do something like、uh, a username and a password, but we're going to keep it simple, focus only on the essence of the idea, and do something like just the user's name. So in login.html, I'm going to extend. Uh, layout.html as before. I'm going to have my block body and I'm going to have my end block tag. And then inside of here, I'm going to have a form, the action for which will be slash login, the method for which will be post. I'll do best practices here. I don't want my username and password in the real world being stored in people's、uh, autocomplete histories. Let me do input. Auto complete equals off for good measure. Auto focus for convenience. Name equals the user's name. Placeholder as before equals name. And then type equals text. And then down here, input type equals submit. So this is almost the same to our previous forms for registering and so forth, but now I'm going to use it for login purposes. So let's do a quick check. Let me go back to my application, do flask run. I'm going to go ahead and open up my URL. And first error, <laughs> let's see. 
template not found. OK, so that's actually expected. I kind of knew I didn't create index.html, so I'm OK with that error for now. Let me go ahead and zoom out, though, because I deliberately wanted to go to my slash login route, because I wanted to test that first. That seems to be working. Now let's go ahead and create the file that doesn't exist index.html. So index.html, put this in my login folder in templates. And I'm going to do this one pretty similarly. I'm going to go ahead and copy paste just to save a bit of keystrokes. But here I'm going to say, you are not logged in, because I literally haven't implemented that feature yet. So that's pretty reasonable. Let me go ahead and restart Flask. Let me go to my index. And I should see, indeed, you are not logged in. But if I go to login, I see my login form. So let's make this a little more interactive. Let me go into index.html here and say, you are not logged in, ahref slash login, log in, period. Let's create a better user interface. So let me rerun Flask. Let me go back to my web page, hit reload, and now I have the beginnings of a user interface. Super simple, but very similar to a website where if you're presented with the web page, you're not logged in, you're given a link or a button or something to log in. And if I click this, it's just a simple GET request, which is the default for links to slash login. So we're almost there, right? We almost have the ability to log in. Let's do something with the information. So let me go back to application.py. And when the user logs in, what is it I want to have happen exactly? Well, if they log in, first of all, I want to support multiple,、uh, I want to support post here. So let me do that for privacy's sake. And then let me go ahead and do this. If request.method equals post, as before, Let's go ahead and、hmm, remember that user logged in and then redirect user to slash.、Uh, to slash. Else, let's go ahead and render the login form. So I'm not done yet, but this is the key idea. I need to somehow remember that the user logged in. So how can I do this? Well, one, I can get the user's name from request.form.getName. And I should assume that I,、um, yeah, that's OK. We won't validate that for now. And what do I want to do with the user's name? I want to store it in the session. So, what exactly is the session? Well, it turns out that as soon as you have this hand stamp, it's like,、um, It's kind of like a coat check, too. I don't mean to add too many metaphors here, but in、like、a fancy restaurant, if you、like、hand your coat to someone, they'll often put it in the closet and then hand you back a number, which in some sense is like a little clue like this, a little hand stamp so that they can line you up. It probably shouldn't just be a smiley face, because otherwise everyone would get the same coat back, but they give you some kind of identifier. And they put your coat into some,、like、a hanger, a bucket, or some space in that closet. So, why is this relevant here? Well, the same is kind of happening in the world of web browsers. When you get a unique cookie, that's like giving You a, a unique hanger. I really should have thought this meta through, metaphor through before, but you're given a unique hanger where all of your stuff can go, including your code, but in this case, including any variables you want to remember. So, with that said, what I have access to thanks to Flask, but really thanks to HTTP, is this special variable called session. That is a special variable in that it's at the one hand, on the one hand, global, which means I can use it everywhere, but fancy enough, It's tied to the current user. So even if all of us on Zoom right now visit my URL, as is kind of happening anyway, each of us is getting our own copy of a variable called session. And it's implemented underneath the hood by way of this cookie mechanism. Each of us, when you visit my application, are getting a different cookie value. That cookie value is like mapping to a different hanger in the closet so that my data will go on this hanger, your data will go on that hanger, and so forth. And now I'm actually kind of proud of this metaphor that's working out OK. The hanger is going to be where all of our individual data is stored. What do we want to store? This is simple. Let's just store the user's name, thereby remembering that I've logged in, or Brian's logged in, or Sophia's logged in, or Ryan's logged in, or anyone else. But the session global variable here that I've highlighted in this very first line is going to be implemented by Flask for us in such a way that each of us as users get our own version thereof. So I'm going to quite simply use this as a dictionary in Python. I'm going to go ahead and add、uh, to the session here. Uh, the user's name as name. And I don't even need this variable now. Let me tighten this up just a little bit. Let me go ahead and just store in the session, which is like this hanger, the key of name and the value of whatever the user logged in as. And redirects, I know how to do. Let me go ahead and return,、uh, return redirect slash. Let me get rid of my pseudocode. And I think that's it. 
that is sufficient, excuse me, to remember that a user has logged in. You sort of put their name in the session, but then it stands to reason that we need to check for this value. So now let's improve index.html, which at the moment just blindly says always you are not logged in. Well, let's actually make that decision, not just hard code that. So let's do this. If、um, not session.getName, this is the syntax for saying if there's no name in the session, then go ahead and return redirect slash login. So if there's no name in the session, that means you haven't given me your name yet. Let me force you to by sending you to slash login. Otherwise, go ahead and render the template. All right, well, what more might I do now? Well, let me go into my index file here. And instead of just naively hard coding this, watch what I can now do. I can in here say, in Jinja syntax, not the curly braces, not the block syntax, not the for loop, you can also use if conditions. If session.name exists, then I can say something like, you are logged in as session.name, period. Then I might have something like a href equals slash logout. Doesn't exist yet, but we can come back to that. Logout. Else, if there is no session name, then let's assume that the user is indeed not logged in and then say you are not logged in, log in. So if I did this right, let me go ahead and stop the server here. Let me go ahead and rerun flask run, reload my form. I still see, <laughs> okay, oh, wrong, wrong URL. Let me go to index. Oh, no, I, this is right. I'm on slash login. Method's not allowed. I think、um, Santiago already pointed out what mistake I made earlier, which I just repeated. Let me go to、uh, application.py.、Um, I need to support multiple methods here. I also want to support get so that I can actually render my template as needed. So let me go ahead and rerun this server. Here we go at slash login. And notice what happens. Let me zoom in on this. Let me get rid of the login and just go to slash. Notice that I'm immediately redirected. Let's do what we did last week. Let's open up the inspector. Let's go to the network tab. Let's again visit slash and hit enter. Voila, notice what happens. If I visit that request, zoom in on Chrome's network tab, scroll down to response headers, notice that we get a 302 found, which is a redirect code like 301. And the location is actually, if you look over here, Slash login. So all the mechanics of、uh, HTTP are coming back into play. All right, let me go ahead and log in as David. Click submit. Amazing. You are logged in as David. Notice what's going on. I'm now at the in slash route. My, this is true, so this does not apply. So I'm actually seeing index.html. And notice I accidentally clicked log out. Let's fix that. Let's give us our log out route. So here we go. App. App.route slash logout, def logout. And then in here, I need to just forget that the user has logged in. And there's a few different ways to do this. Let me do it the simplest for now. Session name equals none. Let's just change whatever your name is or my name is to none. Then let's return redirect back to slash. All right, so let's see what happens now. Let me restart the server. Let me go back to my index page. Because I'm still logged in here, I'm going to go ahead and log out. OK, let me go ahead and log in as Brian, for instance. Submit. You are logged in as Brian. And notice I can reload, I can close the tab, I can reopen the tab. It's all being remembered thanks to my browser representing the cookie. And in fact, you can see that. Let me go to inspect, let me go to the network tab, and let me reload this same page. Reload. Notice this response here in 200. Notice that if I scroll down here to the request headers, notice that my browser is requesting, whoops, sorry. Notice that my browser is requesting slash, but notice if I scroll down, 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 nope,、uh, there we go, down, down, down. Notice, unbeknownst to me and unbeknownst to you, perhaps all this time, my browser is also presenting the hand stamp and saying my cookie value is session equals 35456, dot, dot, dot. Um, generally speaking, it's bad to tell other people your sessions because now you could all hijack my session by pretending to be me. But of course, this application doesn't do anything. But don't do this with accounts that you care about. No one should be seeing your cookie values. So we actually see the cookie there, and it came from the server the very first time I visited. All right. Any questions on that there? Does the cookie just exist forever, or is there a time when it disappears? 
Good question. Does the cookie live forever or is there a time limit? It, there, it depends on how you configure it. So, this cookie will have a default time limit of some number of minutes or hours or days, after which it will expire unless the server refreshes it for me. You can, though, set cookies that do last forever, which you probably don't want to do for the notion of logging in, because odds are all of us have accidentally walked away from like a, a lab computer or a friend's computer, forgotten to log out. It's at least nice to know that eventually I'll be logged out automatically from this site. And that's what's called a session cookie, one that eventually expires. But it's also useful when you visit websites. You notice that some websites have those buttons that say Remember Me or something like that. Well, you can actually set permanent cookies that don't just store some random value on your computer, they actually store some piece of information that gets pre filled into form subsequently. And this is useful to remember your preferred settings for a website. If you've customized something, if you're in night mode or day mode or something like that,、um, it can remember those kinds of settings. And even CSV. 50s website remembers、uh, what your selection was. When you log into some of CS50's websites, you'll sometimes see a login prompt for Harvard or Yale. And if you've never noticed,、uh, I, I regret this because we put a lot of effort into this, it remembers if you used Harvard last time or used Yale last time, so you don't have to constantly interact with the dropdown. It just remembers your implied preference. We do that using cookies. And so, as an at home exercise of interest, truly do start opening the browser's network tab, start looking at those headers. And you can begin to infer how all of today's websites work. And in fact,、um, it's becoming increasingly a challenge to implement things with cookies because, long story short, a lot of the browser manufacturers are finally starting to disable what are called third party cookies, those sort of advertising style cookies that come from other servers, not gmail.com, not facebook.com, but other servers that are all too often used to track. People. But if,、uh, recently, especially in the EU and now more recently in the US, if you've ever had to click boxes saying, I accept cookies, I accept necessary cookies, and so forth, honestly, this is sort of a nice idea, but it's also a little silly in that now the world is just conditioning you and, I,、uh, you and uh, me to just constantly click these boxes without really thinking of it. But what you're really doing is granting permission when you click those boxes to allow your hand to be stamped. All right, any questions then on cookies? Or, on how we've gone about implementing this login mechanism. Seeing anything on your end, Brian? Nothing else here. All right, well, let me go ahead and do this. Let me go ahead and get ready an example that we made in advance that will allow us to explore a full fledged e commerce site, a store of some sort. And we'll call this literally store. And this time, rather than write things from scratch, let me go ahead and open things in my browser from a directory called store. So this is available as always on the course's、uh, website. And let me go ahead here and into store, let me go ahead and open up application.py, requirements.txt, and my templates, including layout. Books and cart. So, this is a good exercise in honestly reading a someone else's sizable amount of code. It's a few files. How do you even begin when you've downloaded a program like this, when you've downloaded distribution code for CS50 or any other course? How do you begin to wrap your mind around it? Well, again, if you understand what the roles are played by these different files, application.py is your controller, anything ending in .html and templates is a view, you can begin to sort of follow the breadcrumbs and figure out what does what in these files. So, let's start with application. .py. Notice I'm importing CS50's library, a bunch of Flask functionality, including session support. Below that, I'm initializing the application, as I've done before. And below that, I'm connecting to a database which contains a whole bunch of products in a store, books in this case. I then configure sessions, and we just did that. So that code is the same as before. And I think we can begin to infer what this website's going to do. So my default slash route has an index function, and it looks like there's a table. In that database called books. So I'm selecting star from books to get me all the books. And then it looks like I'm rendering a template called books.html and I'm passing in those books. So let's, let's、um, follow the breadcrumbs here and go into books.html. It looks like books.html extends layout.html. All right, let's look at layout.html. Eh, nothing really interesting going on there, just the boilerplate placeholder code that we've seen before. So I'm going to close that and assume that、eh, it's not interesting. Been there, done that. But books.html, if we continue further, is a little juicy. We've got my block body between lines 3 and 14. In there, I've got a h1 tag just saying books at the top of the page. And then I've got a for loop in my template, again using Jinja syntax, that has below that an h2 with apparently the title of a book. And then below that, a form. 
And I haven't seen all of these features before. Like, I'm not sure yet what hidden means. But notice that I do recognize a submit button that has a value of add to cart. So it sounds like we're implementing a shopping catalog for like an Amazon.com or some kind of bookstore online. All right. So now let's go back to application.py and let's look in cart. It looks like cart supports both get and post. All right, so maybe I'm using the same route to handle two different things, and we've seen that before. The function's called cart, which makes sense. This thing, let's come back to this just to initialize our session. We'll come back to that. And it looks like there's not much more to this program. If、uh, get is the verb, let's focus on the bottom first. So let's ignore the if condition. What am I doing? Selecting star from books where the ID of the book is in this list of books. Well, where is this list of books coming from? Session, quote unquote, cart. So in the last example, I used the session to store your name and my name and everyone's name on a per user basis. Now I'm using it to store what we'll call a shopping cart. And indeed, this is the reason why there's a shopping cart, thanks to our friends at the theater on stage. This is how shopping carts are implemented on websites via cookies underneath the hood to give you the illusion. Of user specific variables, dictionaries that you can store anything you want in there. So it looks like my session cart key is going to have a value equal to like the IDs of a whole bunch of books. I don't know how they're there yet, but let's assume that's what I'm interpreting. And then down here, I'm just rendering a template called cart.html, passing in the books from the database. So how do they get into the session? Well, if the user submits the form to the cart, I think this code is now relevant. If the user posts to slash cart, it looks like I'm going to get the ID that they've typed in, maybe, maybe. And if there is, in fact, an ID and it's not none, it's not the default value of none, I'm going to go ahead and append to the cart the ID of that book. And then I'm going to redirect the user to cart. So I think that's enough complexity that I think it's time to look at what's actually going on. So let me go ahead and do exactly that. Let me scroll up and run Flask Run. Let me go ahead and open my URL. OK, a y it's not the prettiest of websites, but it looks like my database has like all seven Harry Potter books in it. And notice that each of them has a button add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. Let's look at the HTML source to see what my books.html template generated. Kind of interesting. So there's that H1 books at the top. Here's the first of my H2s with the title of the book. Notice that there is this funky symbol here because it's like a curly quote. So, this is one of those HTML entities that lets you output symbols that you couldn't type easily on your keyboard. Here's my first form that I dynamically outputted. And I claimed earlier that I didn't know what hidden was, but it, it does what it says. It allows you to submit a piece of data in a form that is visually hidden from the user. It's not a text box that they can type into, but it is there. And what's cool about this is that notice I gave it a value of one. But in this form, I gave that hidden field a value of two. Down here, a value of three. Well, why is that? Let me go into my IDE for just a moment. Let me run SQLite on my store.db. Let me show you with dot schema that inside of this. Database is a books table, each of which has an ID, a title, and that's it. Let me do select star from books using SQLite 3, and voila, you see not only the titles of the books, but a unique ID numbered、uh, aptly according to the order in which they came out, as a coincidence, but intentional. And so now down here, let me go ahead and move my terminal down a little bit here. Let me go ahead and rerun Flask Run. And if I now submit one of these forms, let's see what happens. Add to cart, the first book. Interesting. I've been redirected to slash cart, and notice I have an ordered list, an OL tag, it would seem, with that first book. Let me go back to the catalog.、Uh, Prisoner of Azkaban was pretty good. Let's add that to cart. Now I see this here. And notice this. If I reload, reload, re I don't know why I'm holding up my hand because I'm clearly using my other hand, but I'm reloading the page again and again, and it's showing me exactly what is in my cart. So, where is this coming from? Well, if we go back to our code, this logic here under the post condition is adding the ID, book number one, book number three, to my session's cart key. Now, where did that cart key come from? This is the only other piece I proposed we come back to. I just need some way at the top of my code to initialize the cart. And long story short, there's not going to be a key called cart in the session unless you put it there. Like Flask doesn't come with name or cart. You have to put it there. So notice if cart, quote unquote, is not yet in my session, I'm just initializing it to an empty Python list.
And I could use a set, I could use a dictionary, I could use anything I want. I chose to keep it simple with a list, but that's how I'm remembering. What's in my cart? And unlike all of our previous examples, because I see a bunch of you are now trying to add things to your own cart, each of us is seeing different shopping carts. We all have different things in our shopping cart. If I keep reloading, it doesn't matter how many of you are trying to add books to your cart, you're only adding them literally to your cart and not mine, because we all have different、uh, stamps on our hand. All right, so here too, I would encourage you when you next time you go on Amazon and like add something to your cart, like literally that is all that's happening underneath the hood. And Amazon surely has other features. You can change quantities, which is kind of nice. You can add things to wish lists, which is nice. But all of that, if you start looking at the HTML and you look at the network requests going back and forth, all of those features that we just take for granted these days are just built on very simple, H, well, relatively simple HTML forms and these inputs and these buttons and on the server. These sessions. And Amazon might be using a different language, a different framework, but all of these ideas are the same. And so, indeed, this week is not about teaching you Flask, which in a few years' time will probably be irrelevant. It's about teaching these ideas and principles of these HTTP requests and responses, these cookies, these sessions, and the features that we can therefore build on top of them. All right, I think we have time for one final example that will now bring back our old friend JavaScript from last week. Up until now, we have been using Python on the server to generate dynamically HTML. And even though my designs today have been hideous, you could certainly imagine adding CSS to them, some classes, some bootstrap, just to pretty things up, like the forms especially. But that's not uh, uh, anything new versus last week. But last week we did have JavaScript as a programming language, but it was a client side programming language, at least in our usage thereof. It was a way of getting the user's browsers to run code, conditions and functions and loops and so forth. On the browser, not on the server. Today, we've introduced Python again, so we have now the ability to do something on the server. And where the web gets really interesting these days is when we marry the so called front end that the user sees and the back end, which is the server. The front end is the user interface you and I interact with, the back end is the Python code, the SQL code that the humans never see, but you, the programmer, see. So, what can we do to sort of combine these two?、Um, Components ultimately, front end and back end. Well, let's do something like this. Let's bring back our old database of shows. And let me go ahead and show you quickly what's in this folder here. In shows, we have、uh, SQLite3 shows.db, a smaller version of what we played with a few weeks back. I've whittled this down just for size's sake to have only the names,、uh, only the IDs of TV shows and the titles of TV shows, and that's it. I threw away the ratings and the writers and the directors and all of that just to keep the focus only on the titles because now we're going to start sending a lot of data back and forth over the internet using Python and JavaScript. Well, let me go ahead now and open up this example as made in advance, and this is in shows, and we'll see a few files here application.py, requirements.txt. And my templates, which are index and layout and search. All right, so a bunch, but not more than we've really seen before. And let's go ahead and I kind of cheated earlier. I didn't look at requirements, but I might as well look at requirements for good measure. Here's just an example of what else might be in requirements.txt, CS50 library, and Flask. And again, those are pre installed in the IDE, but we do this so that if you get adventurous and try running these things on your own Mac or PC, you have all the configuration that you need. Well, let's start as before. With applications.py. And let me go ahead and do this first. Let me run this thing first so we can actually see the app in motion, then understand how it works. So if I visit this, let me go ahead and type in office. All right, nothing happens yet. Let me click search. OK, I then see a big bolded list of all shows that mention office. So not the office per se, but an office. And let me go ahead and zoom out here and look at the URLs. Let me go back here. Let me point out that we're at the slash route. Again, the slash is there. It's just Chrome is hiding it by default these days. And when I search for something like Office and hit Enter, notice that I end up at slash search. Question mark Q equals office. So I borrowed some inspiration from Google. right? I kind of cheated last week where I really only implemented the front end to Google, the HTML form, and then I let Google find me some cats and some dogs and so forth. But now, as、uh, With Python, you now have the ability to implement both sides of that application. So if I look at the source code here, notice that I seem to be returning a really big unordered list of list items that represent, again, all the titles of Office related shows.
All right, this is fine and good, but this is sort of like old school web programming where you fill out a form, you hit enter, and boom. But these days, recall, most anytime you visit a website, lots is happening at once. You've got some autocomplete going on here. You've got chat messages popping up here. You've got a map over here that's automatically moving, and the little car for Uber is moving around at the same time. Like the web of today, Web 2.0, if you will, which is not a technical term as much as it is a、uh, buzzword, refers to just increasingly dynamic. Web interactions between users and computers. And with JavaScript and with your own backend, be it Python or something else, you can now begin to build these more dynamic interfaces as well. Wouldn't it be cool if when I start typing O, F, F, I, C, E, we actually immediately saw the results? And we've seen this already. Last week, remember that I started searching for all words that start with A, and I used our really large dictionary from PSET 5, but that was 140,000 words, but just words. This database of titles is several megabytes large, and I don't necessarily want to send the entire database of movies to the browser,、uh, one, because of performance and size, and maybe two, intellectual property. I don't really want to send every user my entire database. You can imagine wanting to keep a little more control over the data you're providing, requiring users to log in. Or pay for your service or the like. So, there's reasons where you might want the browser to talk to the server and only get the data the user is searching for, not the whole thing. So, let's do that. Let's enhance this shows application in such a way that it actually does things more dynamically. But let's first understand how it works. So, I have a couple of libraries here CS50s and Flask. I'm configuring Flask here. I'm then configuring my database here. Down here, I just have a very simple route that renders index.html, which apparently, let's take a look, has that form. Very simple, very similar to last week, very similar to today, all of the forms we've done thus far. Here's that name equals Q, and everything else is pretty boilerplate. So let's get rid of that file now. The layout, also pretty boilerplate. It looks like things in the past. So let's close that one as well and go back to index、uh, application.py. So, the juicy part seems to be the search route. And this was the piece we were missing last week when we used Google instead to find us some cats and some dogs. Here I have a route called slash search, a function called search that will be called for that route. And here is kind of a nice amalgam of SQL and Python. I'm going to give myself a variable called shows, which is going to be the result of all of the rows that come back when I execute this. Select star from shows where title is like. This placeholder question mark. Now, what am I going to plug in? Notice it's a little cryptic at first glance, but I seem to be taking the user's input, Q, from request.args.get. So that's using get apparently because of the word args. It's not form now, it's request.args. So I'm getting the user's Q value, which was office in my case. And just as a quick check, what's with the percent signs on the left and the right? Because we've seen a lot of percent signs today, but these are different. Perhaps in the chat, what do these percent signs represent in this context? Brian, you want to echo the consensus? Yeah, people are saying they're SQL placeholders. Yeah, so pl SQL wildcard placeholders. That means zero or more characters to the left, zero or more to the right. This is why I was getting mass,、uh, matches with office at the beginning of the word, office at the end, and office in the middle. If I really wanted to be anal, I could get rid of the percent signs and require only a perfect match, but that's not my goal with this particular implementation. Once I get back all of, whoops, once I get back all of these rows, I have here. A line return render template, search.html, passing in all of those shows. So the last thing to look at is search.html. It's pretty simple. And surely, like an hour ago, this would have looked super cryptic. It frankly might very well still look cryptic. But once you start using this syntax yourself, you'll see that, oh, this is just a template that is allowing me to dynamically output an unordered list of li tags, each of which represents the title of a show that's been passed into this template. All right. So now, then, the final flourish. Let's go about enhancing this application so that there is no form to submit in the same way, but instead, all of the logic actually happens between JavaScript and the back end. I'm going to go ahead and do this first. I'm going to go back to application.py here. And instead of this here, I'm going to go ahead and do the following. I'm going to go ahead and instead of rendering a template, I'm going to use a new function called JSONify. It's kind of a funny name, and I have to import it up here. So let me import JSONify. 
It turns out that JSONify or JSON means JavaScript object notation. And we'll see what it looks like in a moment. But the world years ago standardized on a format for transmitting data between servers and browsers using a very lightweight text format JSON or JSON, JavaScript object notation. JSONify is a Flask function that takes a Python list. Or a Python dictionary and converts it into JSON format. So we'll see this in just a moment. So notice that I'm now returning the JSONification of the shows variable, which recall is just the rows that came back from db.execute. So let's see this in action. I'm actually going to go to my,、uh, let me go ahead and restart the server because I've made some changes. Let me go ahead and now go to the server slash search. Question mark Q equals office. So I'm going to manually visit this URL and hit enter. Notice what comes back. It's kind of cryptic at first glance here, but notice this is indeed what's called JavaScript object notation. There's a square bracket over here at top left. This means, hey browser, here comes a list. There's a curly brace, which means, hey browser, here comes a dictionary, otherwise known as an object in JavaScript. Quote unquote ID is the key in this dictionary. 108878 is the value of that key. Here comes the second key, quote unquote title, the value of which is nice day at the office, quote unquote. Then there's a close curly brace, which is end of the dictionary or end of the object, a comma, and then there's a whole bunch of these other dictionaries. So in short, all we're looking at here is a very raw text based format. Of a Python dictionary converted to, again, something called JSON, JavaScript object notation, which literally this is about it. JSON uses double quotes, colons, curly braces, and square brackets. And that's about it to represent information. So this is great, but this is a horrible, horrible user interface if what the user sees is this mess. But that's not the point. The point now is to have our backend return a JSON array of search results and let the browser convert it into HTML. Recall from last week I claimed that with JavaScript you can mutate or change your DOM, the document object model, the tree in memory. And what you can do in particular with JavaScript is add more nodes to that tree. You can add more things to that family tree like structure. So, yes, hello. We just got, hi David, hi David, hi David via get. Thank you very much. OK. a y So, let me minimize that and let me open up now、um, not search.html, which we're not going to bother using anymore, but instead index.html. And in index.html, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and borrow some code here. I'm going to go ahead and open up index.html and I'm going to simplify this. Let me stop the server. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my layout template and I'm going to get rid of my search template because I just don't need them anymore. So I'm going to simplify this program and focus entirely now on、uh, index.html. So, what do I want to do in here? I need to involve some JavaScript now. So, how am I going to go about doing this? Well, first, I need to go ahead and bar, use a library、uh, called jQuery. And jQuery is something that's a little、um, decreasing in popularity, but it's still used by Bootstrap. And so, we'll continue using it because you're already including it, in fact, for some of your other examples. But we need a different version of it. So, I'm going to quickly Google jQuery CDN. I'm going to go to this website. And long story short, there's a lot of libraries out there that you can use by just grabbing their script tag and using it inside of your own. So, I'm going to go ahead here and let me just clean up the tag so it's all in one long, if ugly, line. But by copying and pasting that line, which we'll typically do for you in the problem sets and distribution code, I'm going to go ahead and copy that library into my file so that it's among the libraries I can use. And now I'm going to go ahead, just as we did last week, and I'm going to add a script tag inside of my own page's head. And then down here, let's see, where do I want to do this? Actually, you know what? Let me go ahead and do this a little differently. Just for consistency with what you'll see online. I'm going to go ahead and do this all in my body so we don't have to worry about. Uh, things being out of order. We'll indeed keep it all inside of the page's body. And what I'm going to do is give myself this an input, autocomplete equals quote unquote off,、uh, autofocus, and then I'm going to give it a placeholder of query, and then a type of text. So I'm going to have a very simple search box there, and I'm going to have an unordered list with nothing in it. And that's deliberate for now. Then I'm going to import this,、uh, the、uh, jQuery library. And then down here, inside of my own script tags, this is where I'm going to make,、uh, write the actual code. 
I'm going to do let input equals document dot get.、Uh, let's do query selector, just like last week. And let me go ahead and select my input tag. This works. I don't need an ID or any class because at the moment I only have one input. So, query selector of quote unquote input will give me that tag specifically. Let me go ahead now and add to that input an event listener that listens for the key up event. Recall from last week our discussion of events and key up, like the user touching and letting go of the key, is one of the events you can listen for. And anytime the user does that, I want to call the following. Function. And it's an anonymous function, which we saw last week too. And what I'm going to do inside of this anonymous function is the following I'm going to call a new function, the only new JavaScript function today, called dollar sign underscore get. This is shorthand notation for jQuery dot get. But I'm sorry, dollar sign dot get is shorthand for jQuery dot get. And I'm going to go ahead and get the following I'm going to get a slash search URL. With a question mark followed by q equals, and then I'm going to go ahead and put input dot value. So notice with this line of code, this JavaScript string, I'm kind of dynamically constructing in JavaScript code the URL that I want to request shows from. Slash search, question mark, q equals, whatever the value of the input box was that the user typed something into. And the way this dollar sign dot get function works is it supports what is called a callback. A callback is a function that will eventually be called when it has an answer for you. And this is important on the web. The internet can sometimes be slow, and you might want to write code that contacts another server, like I'm about to do now, and that server might be slow, or the internet connection might be slow, and it would be annoying if your entire browser froze while you waited and waited and waited for the server's response to come back. It's a lot nicer if you can say, when you have The data, call me back, so to speak, sort of、um, metaphorically on the phone, call me back by calling this function. So, what function do I want it to call? I want it to call this anonymous function that's going to take as input an argument called shows, but I could call that anything I want. And I'm going to do this I'm going to create an HTML string that's initially nothing, quote unquote. I'm then going to do this, a for loop in JavaScript, letting a variable called ID. Equal to whatever ID is in the shows that just came back to me. And now inside of this for loop, let me go ahead and inside of this for loop, create a title that's equal to shows, which is again the data that came back, on the,、uh, came back via that callback, so to speak, shows.id.title and semicolon. Then I'm going to do HTML plus equals. Quote unquote list item plus title plus quote unquote close list item. Then down here, lastly, I'm going to do document.query selector quote unquote ul dot inner HTML gets HTML. All right, this is definitely the craziest thing we've done thus far today, and it's tying together so many different ideas, not to mention new syntax. So, of all the examples, don't worry too much if this is just. A lot at once. The goal really now is not to introduce you to this syntax so that you can repeat it tomorrow, but rather the idea of what we're doing. So, what are we doing? We have a simple web page with a text input. We've got a simple web page with an unordered list that's currently empty. Below that, we're including this third party JavaScript library called jQuery, which Bootstrap also happens to use for some of its graphical components. Then I have my own JavaScript code that first declares a variable that gives me access to the input tag on my own web page a few lines above. I'm then using this fancy function, $get, to do what's called an AJAX call. AJAX refers to the ability. For a web page to make additional HTTP requests programmatically to a server. It is allow- This is how all websites today get your chat messages if a friend just messaged you on some platform. It's how, when you're typing in、uh, your address, it can auto complete your address based on the entire globe's worth of addresses. It's how Google Search auto complete works as well. Dollar sign dot get is a function built into jQuery that's using some standard JavaScript functionality that's going to allow me to visit the URL that ends with slash search question mark q equals. Whatever the human typed in. And when the response is ready, this anonymous function is going to get called back and it's going to be handed an input, an argument called shows that is going to equal this stuff. This is what my JavaScript function is going to receive as its shows argument. And notice it's a list or an array. 
inside of which is a list of dictionaries or objects with two keys, ID and title. This, let me stipulate, happens to be the syntax in JavaScript for iterating over such a data structure. And this happens to be the syntax in JavaScript for allowing me to create one line after another, another li, another li, appending it using concatenation. To this variable called HTML. And this very last line of code says to the browser, go select me that UL and plug into its inner HTML, the contents of it, the value of my variable. And now, crossing my fingers, I did not screw up syntactically. Let me go ahead and do Flask run. I still need to run Flask because I do have a back end here. Let me go back to my browser and reload the slash route. Let me go ahead now and type in O, F, damn it. Oh, wait, it was just slow. So notice everything I've typed thus far, or everything I'm seeing thus far, matches the word off. And if I continue this, office, and let it search and let the internet do its thing, now indeed it's been whittled down to a list of office matches. And notice again, if I go to the inspect tab, open the network、uh, tab under inspect, let me go ahead and type in office. Notice here that every keystroke I typed triggered O, F, F, I, C, E to be executed.、Uh, to Triggered an AJAX call, that is an HTTP call to the server. And notice that if I click on the last one there, scroll down, I will see not only my request and my response, but if I click on the response, I'll indeed see this big JSON array. Of all of the data. And it's actually rather fortuitous that it was slow because we were going to end with one demo. For instance, if I want to, was curious to know, being indoors all day, what the weather is like, I might maybe call Brian up on this here telephone. Hello? <laughs> Hi, Brian.、Uh, do you know what the,、uh, the weather is like outside today?、Uh, I haven't been outside in a little bit, but I can check and I will call you back. Okay, and notice it would be annoying if I had to wait on the phone for him to go outside. So I'm going to hang up and I'm just going to wait for him to call me back. And that's exactly what's happening in my code. When I pass this anonymous function to this get function, and the get here means HTTP get, this is telling the browser, call this function once you have the answer, much like hopefully Brian's about to have the end. And indeed, The call back. Hello. Hi.、Uh, I looked up the weather.、Uh, it looks like it's going to be a brisk fall day today. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And that is it for CS50. We will see you all next time.